Oh, look at that. It's uh, off to a brilliant start. It didn't take the logo down off the screen. Welcome to, to um, the Ultra Professional ProSynth Network live show, uh, episode 73, I believe. Uh, it is Friday, the 27th of August, if you're watching the live show. Of course, if you're watching on catch up, then it's whatever day it might be then. But welcome to you, whether you're watching live or whether you're watching uh, from some other time zone. What's it like in the future? Tell me. Um, we, uh, we're we down one member at the moment, just to let you know, Chris is having a few snags, but he will uh, join us very shortly. Um, but we are joined as ever by my, uh, my other co-host, uh, partner in crime, uh, Mr. Ben Simpson. Ben, how are you? I'm all right, yeah, not too bad. Good, good, good. Uh, Been busy. Uh, I've had a, I've had a bit of a week off, really, from doing anything that I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have been doing a couple of like of my own things, you know, just try. Well, I've been trying out software and stuff. All oh, right, okay. And, but then that that always like leads on to coming up with some sort of idea for a tune yeah isn't it? then you play it someone they say it's crap and you move on and that's, <laughs> that's pretty much how it goes Vicky, you mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh dear anyway so um any more gigs recently uh yeah we we, we did play it the weekend uh yeah yeah it was pretty good it was actually really good uh good. but we're on a restricted rocks festival on sunday so sounds interesting that's going to be quite good that one hopefully good stuff excellent well we'll um, we'll say hello to chris when he uh, eventually gets here but let's welcome our very special guest uh this week none other than mr mel wesson how are you oh uh, to bring you back in there we go no, we, all the camera shots are messed up there we go let's do this properly now mel welcome to the show how are you very much um i'm fine i'm fine good good excellent i'm gonna take every stuff. day the day comes, but today i'm good <laughs> Excellent. And we find you in your, your little studio here with uh, a lovely yeah. backdrop there. What have yeah. we got there? I can't, I'm trying to pick out. So obviously you've got a Moog. Yeah, it's a Moog. modular. It's a 3C Moog. Um, nice. Uh, PPG modular, PPG 300, yeah. Moog 15, you can see. Um, Synthy at the top left. It's Synthy. Yeah, that's a yeah. reissue. That's one of Robin's reissues. Oh, ah, right. Very nice. It is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And below that, it says a PPG 1020 mm -hmm. and a Wave 2. Nice. Which That's works. Uh, yes. I, mean, I love the Wave 2. Yeah. Great. Can't beat a bit of digital. No. Excellent no. stuff. Well, look, thanks ever so much for coming on. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to be talking to you a little bit more in depth uh, about you and your career and what you've done and... Uh, your your synth stories and what have you so we'll be interrogating you a little bit further later um if anybody in the chat has got any questions for mel um then do make sure you uh, pop them in there wait until we actually start that kind of part of the show otherwise they just get lost in the chat and we can't find them but when you do have a question if you tag either myself uh well actually tag pro synth network or tag uh, ben simpson or you can tag Cynthia Sound, Mr. Chris, oh, hey. he's with us at last. Nice one. Had some issues, sir. <laughs> I had all the issues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about that, guys. I got started early setting this stuff all up, and then uh, the video software seemed to have been giving me some problems, and oh, it dear. caused some problems in Logic, and I don't know. Anyway, I'm here now. So Good. And, and otherwise, <laughs> are you well? I'm well, other than that. <laughs> Good. Glad to hear it. Well, Chris, meet Mel. Mel, meet Chris. We've already done the other Chris. introductions. <laughs> um, pleasure to have you on. Absolutely. You. Um, so what 
what uh, we'll do is we'll do as we normally do. We'll just kind of go over some of the uh, the news topics of the week. There's not a huge amount, um, but that gives us more time to talk to Mel. Um, but before we do that, let's just get some of the little housekeeping stuff out of the way. So, of course, um, if you are watching us on YouTube already, you don't need, need me to tell you that you can find us over on YouTube. But you can also find us on Facebook on instagram and of course on twitter and the handle is the same throughout at prosynth network uh do follow us on those social media channels to get updates and of course the facebook group is where you know everybody congregates and talks about stuff and passes the hours um if you want to help us keep on air which would be uh really cool uh you can donate to us the link is below the video uh, on youtube it's uh, in the description but there it is on screen if you want to make a donation and thanks to everyone that, that continues to do so it's always always makes my my heart sing when i see a little email come up saying that someone's made a donation it's really really appreciated and it keeps us on air um a little bit longer and of course the other thing that you can do is um you can subscribe to us and make sure that you uh, you hit that bell i've even got a graphic for that look at this there you go all fancy hit that subscribe button and it doesn't cost you anything and what it does do is it helps us keep in touch with you every time uh, we have a new show coming up you'll get notified and it makes us look better and we get more features and things and yeah you know the score um so there you go that's all the kind of the business stuff out of the way um as i said there's not a huge amount of news topics out there this week so let's kind of dive in with probably the biggest hardware news of the week and um, this was something that we spoke about last week because it was uh, unfortunately leaked I said last week it was by a Dutch retailer it's actually a Belgian one so I'm told it's not much between them let's be honest but um, it was uh, and it was kind of leaked on their website and uh, eventually I don't know whether it forced sequentials hand but we now have um, this which is the take five compact polysynth and we'll discuss um, the description of it maybe in, in a little while. But it's an interesting um, uh, little synth. It's a 44 full-size key synth with a width of just 26 inches. They really seem to be pushing this, or try, trying to justify its compactness. But basically, it's a five-voice polysynth that, um, that has some you know, classic sequential stuff going on in terms of the hardware. The interface looks very Pro 3-like. Um, it's got it's got a profit five type four pole filter a uh, couple of lfos one global one per voice uh two envelopes and delay envelopes extensive modulation a 64 step polyphonic sequencer and a multi-mode arpeggiator with a premium fatal keybed uh which seems to be uh becoming a, a more and more of a common thing um there was also there was a uh, a video and i'm just going to kind of just play this so that you can all kind of get uh, the gist um so here we go let's bring this up on the screen and play this for you now So allegedly every sound in this video is made by Take 5, including the drums. But they really do seem to be pushing this thing like, oh, you yeah, just pick it up and sling it over to your mate in the next room. If this is like any other sequential synth, it's not going to be light. But it certainly looks robust. And... Judging by the sound of it, it sounds very nice and very sequential-esque, I guess. Um, I'll reserve my thoughts uh, just for now. But let's, let's, um, let's give our guests the, the first honour of um, conveying their, their thoughts. But what, what do you think about this one, Mel? You, you any, um, does this float your boat? Is this going to make you go out and rush and buy one of these? Well, OK, first of all, I'm a huge fan of sequential massive 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 and that goes back to i mean i was i might have actually been the person that unboxed the first profit in the uk oh, yeah, were, were, yeah i mean argents were the um, importer they were the sole uh sole importer remember that was 78 79 
And I remember getting the mm. first one out, and, and it's just it was just everything you wanted, you know. It, it looked like a mini mode. It was polyphonic. It, it did everything you could possibly want, and and ten times more. So ever since then, I've 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 been a massive fan of Dave Smith and everything that he stands for. I mean, I think mm. the company's got. Uh, oh God, it's like I, they should give me a job actually, shouldn't they? <laughs> yeah, they should. <laughs> they, they've got so much integrity, and they they build great machines. And I've always had one. I've always had a Profit Five or something by them, and I've got a twelve at the moment, mm-hmm. which was Dave Smith Instruments, so you know, yeah, previous um, whatever. And I, I was actually thinking about the five or. The, or the or the ten. I wouldn't keep mm. them both. You know, you know, one in, one out. But um, I just like his stuff. I like the way that I, I like the way that they think. I like the way that they sound. So, mm. so I I did a little bit of research on this because he did send me the link, and it's a third of the price of the five. So it's sort of like an entry level profit, isn't it? Yeah. 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 I mean, what's 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 not to like? Absolutely. It does. A lot of people are saying that it seems like an accessible way into the Dave Smith, or should I say, sequential sound. Yeah. Um, I think the the list price is going to be around twelve nine nine euros or twelve nine nine US. So that's like you say, it's about a third of the price of of a Profit Five and probably a quarter of the Profit Ten, uh, which is one that I'd still kind of lust after. Really but yeah. yeah, it's it's you know it's it's. Clearly got the DNA. It's got the the um, the quality in there. But I'm just I, I looked at this and I looked at the I thought three and a half octave keyboard and a five voice polysynth. <laughs> it, it's almost like it, it shouldn't be that like that. But I don't know, um, Chris. What do you think? You you you've got a nice big analog synth right next to you. There <laughs> is um, does something smaller and more compact appeal? Uh, not so much for me in this case, uh, but I see why they've made it. And I, I, I think one of the things that uh, we forget is that <laughs> a, a lot of the people that we're regularly talking with are 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. And uh, I, I think this is going to appeal in, in a major way to probably younger people. Mm-hmm. And uh, that there's a market for, for Dave Smith and Sequential to really kind of crack into. Now, they've they've done a number of things before, and I, I don't have any experience with their uh, smaller ones. I think they've had the Poly Evolver and the mm-hmm. Morpho and, and some others. I, I just have my OB6, um, and I've you know, spent a lot of time on a profit, of course. But um, I think it will be something that sells well. You know, it's not too expensive. Is it something that, you know, floats my boat? I, I, I think it would probably, you know, make some really great sounds, but it's not something that has a unique quality that I need to go out and get. So I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll probably let this one go by. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, they're clearly aiming it at people that want to you know, move it around, whether it's from studio or in, in a live sense. They, they're really going for compact and portable but it yeah. doesn't seem to be that compact or that portable it just seems to be a bit um just kind of shrunken and i, I just don't i don't get it i don't ben you, you're the gigging musician here um mm. is this something I, that would appeal to you going out live i don't think it's a i don't think it's a gigging thing at all but, no. but maybe uh if you've got like some sort of indie band and they've just got like you know, a keyboard player who plays like the odd lead line here and there or something, but that's no that's no real use to me. That live, that it, it it's just it just does, doesn't fit in, you know, yeah. in, in any way. I also think, uh, like Mel, uh, uh, I, I I love sequential. They're probably my my favourite synthesizer company, and I, I think that this is a great product. But they, there are a couple of issues though, like. I think that the advert, I sound a bit old fashioned here, like, but <laughs> the, the advert is a bit misleading because it says right. all these sounds were created from one synth. Mm. Now, if you're just getting into like music and stuff, which this is kind of aimed at, I suppose, it's a, it, it's definitely sequential's entry level keyboard, you know. So yes. if they're, they're trying to bring people in with this, then they've just said that like you can make tunes like this with this keyboard and. and and it's it, you know they're picking it up, they're putting it under their arm, they're going sitting on the couch, and the adverts making you think that you're going to be able to knock a tune up like that, and you, without multi-track recording audio, you you can't because it can't, it's not multi-timbral, it can't yeah. do all those things at once, and the advert kind of heavily 
hints that it is to me. Yeah. It, it, it That's never. It, it, there's no disclaimer saying that you can't. You know, it's all been done on this keyboard. But you, you, unless you've got 16 of them, you can't play it live. <laughs> you know? Or multi multi track capability. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, 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 and I think that yeah. you know that could be a, a a big reason to buy it for someone. You know, if I was starting out, like, but I know what I was like when I was a kid. That'd be like, oh my god, have you heard that? It could sound like a record just on your own. It's smart, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And, and and that isn't actually what's happening. Not yeah. not without a bit more know how and you know. I mean, it sounds it sounds very much like a very versatile um, instrument, and it's you know it's got the 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 DNA behind it in terms of the sound um and it uses uh i believe it's using the ssi chips which are dave rossum's new versions of the old ssm chips so mm -hmm. you're gonna there's quality and there's you know there's clearly integrity there um it's it, i'm not knocking it i quite like what i've heard I, I, don't get me wrong i just not entirely sure i would want a 44 note keyboard i mean i've got 37s and I've got 61s and I've got 88s and 73s and a 44 just seems like a little odd it just it almost feels I don't know that, that maybe somebody maybe the bean counters got the better of them and said look we need to cut some corners if you want to hit this price point and it's, one of them was it's fine know, for a mono synth isn't it, it, it exactly like, it's absolutely but, fine for a mono synth but you know, oh, yeah. we, I, don't get it. I mean, we, we had this, we had this conversation, didn't we? When when the Poly Brute came out, and we were all saying, "Oh, six voices, that's useless. You need at least eight on a Poly." Yeah. And but at least I remember being, I remember being a bit up in arms about that myself, and then like I realised that my Profit Six has only got six voices. Yeah. So and I don't I've, know I've, ever since I've been playing with it, it's it's not even entered into my head. Oh gosh, I can only play six notes, and I can't. You know, I'm no. not hearing notes dropping. Uh, or stealing or anything, so it's 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 not really an issue. But at least with a sixty-one note, you have, and I say I'm no way a proficient keyboard player, but at least you have the range there to you know to go low or to go high without having to you know hit transpose buttons to to jump up and down. And I don't know, I don't, maybe I'm just maybe well, we're just old men. Yeah, I I I feel the same way like i like having a 61 key which is why i bought the cobalt because it's pretty compact i mean it's it's very compact because i've been switching out in front of on my desk here um, i've been programming on the summit and then using the cobalt as a controller um but it, and it's so much easier to work with the cobalt there mm. but um this week so what little time i've had i uh, i got a uh, a vca module uh euro rack and so i i pulled my little waldorf key uh kb 37 which of course is a 37 key you know, a little Euro rack keyboard and was using that. And so as I was, you know, fiddling with it during the week when I, in my spare moments um, and doing, uh, you know, have it hooked up through logic, I was playing some other stuff. Like I had got that, um, that Spitfire audio, the, the new one, the, mm. uh, uh, I can't remember his name, the pool project one. Yes. The pool project. And yeah. so instead of, you know, moving everything out of the way and putting the bigger keyboard there. I started playing it with the 37 keys. Like, well, I started composing a little something on there and was able to get it done on 37 keys. Mind you, this is not, you know, Chopin or anything. So um, it, it was able to work. I could see, like, yeah, you could make it work, and especially with more modern music styles with 44 key. That said, like, if I have the option, I, I would rather have a desktop module of this um, than a 44 key version because I've already got other keyboards that would, you know, you could prop it up a little bit behind it and have, mm. you know, your 61 key and then have the tone of that thing. And really yeah. glad about the SSM filter on it. That that should be nice. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not, yeah, so I think we're knocking it because of the sound. I think we're just, you know, maybe not convinced yeah. by its presence. Oh, I think yeah. it's good to play. I really do, you know. I think, yeah. I mean, a compact small keyboard. I'm just thinking, I do, I did a few gigs. Years ago, oh, I don't know, four or five years ago, with with I, mean, I don't I don't know I, everything I had was on a laptop and it was really sort of hastily put put together thing. And the only keyboard we could find really quickly was even smaller. You know, it was like two and a half octaves, three octaves, mm. and it was fine. It was absolutely fine. 
I just don't like the name, I have to say, because, <laughs> because I, I don't think of Dave Brubeck, I think of Take That. And I don't want to be thinking of Take That. But I'm, but I'm... Yeah, no, I can understand that. <laughs> no, I, I must admit, it did put me in the mind of, of Dave Brubeck, and I've had that, you know, I've had Take Five ringing around my, my ears yeah. for the last few days. And that's not a bad thing, because it's a great, great piece of music. That, yeah, that should yeah. be the video. That, that that, should be the they piece. should have done an electronic version of, of Take cool. yeah. There's yeah. still time. It, I'm sure a, somebody will. It's a perfect example of a really clever name that isn't very good because they took five keys off it. It's subtractive. It's five voices. <laughs> it, 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 it's the perfect name for it, but it just doesn't work, does it? it? It's not a great name. It doesn't make you go like, "Oh, I've got to get a take five. It's like, oh, I, God. I, I like your your take on it in that it should be called the the took five. The took, took five. five. <laughs> <laughs> took five yeah. keys took off. Five. That's, yeah. Yeah, that's a death but, Ben, you, you're just you're just um, you're just disappointed, Ben, because they stole your logo for the E and take, it, it, didn't they? Yeah, it's definitely yeah. the same. But ah, well. I might have seen it somewhere else. We we both might have robbed it from somewhere. I don't know. But, I'm sure it's you been know, done. As much as like we're grumpy about it, I mean, you can see where the market this this stuff is in right now. And yeah. uh, while well, I bought like the sixty one key cobalt, those those uh, what are they thirty sevens for the yeah. other one? Yeah, I mean they're selling like crazy a lot. And then the wave state and the the uh, what well, all the the other Korg ones, op six um, and mod wave, op six, and yeah. yeah. Those are all selling like crazy, so there is some sort of market for this as much as <laughs> as, as much, much as, as we bemoan it. Yeah, I mean we we are constantly <laughs> talking about these small thirty seven I mean I've got a, a Cobalt eight here, the thirty seven note one, and I like it because it's small and it fits on the desk and that's really uh you know, v very nice to have. But I would love the sixty one note version because it's one of those keys that begs you know, being played across the range, but yeah, there we go. Anyway, look, we've we've spent too much time. Let's wait and see. Let's see if anybody. The, yeah. the the other good thing about sequential is that they announce things as they are about to ship them, so we don't have to wait mm. three or four months. They are mm. shipping boxes are in stores now. Um, and somebody was asking about the price in the chat room. The the suggested price is twelve nine nine euro stroke US. So that's that's all we know at the moment. Sorry, Ben, you had one more thing to add. I was just going to say, like, I don't want to be too negative about it because it is it's a great little intro instrument, isn't it? It's got a bad name and they haven't put enough keys on it, but it sounds great. Yeah. And I think it's going to be really successful. I don't think that who sequential are marketing it at are going to be the audience. It's not for the the synthesis on the go. It, it's so, it's no. for somebody where space is at the premium and they want good quality sounds. That, that yeah. that's what it is for me anyway. It's an odd. Uh, it's, it's it seems to me like almost that they thought right. How are we going to push a forty-four note key? We've had to yeah. take five keys off to keep the price down. How are we going to convince people that this was a deliberate? <gasps> It's compact and it's portable. There you go. Mm. That's what we'll do. And it kind of has that about it. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, and I'd rather it be a, a little more expensive like it is in comparison to things like the Op6 and Wave State, mm. and yeah. have that nice key bed that it has. Yeah. Because um, that's one thing that I've really appreciated. Even the, the Waldorf, that KB37 I have, has a Fatar key bed. Mm. And oh my gosh, it's so much better to use than getting on these other smaller key beds yeah. that have junky keys. Yeah. And the thing is, a 44 note key bed. Cut. I mean, there's not many synths that have got 44 notes. So I imagine that if you look through Fatar's price list, 3761s are probably you know well priced because they're very popular. But 44s, they're probably going to be up there with you know 73s and 88s as being quite because there's not a demand for them. So they have to charge maybe a premium price. So I don't know whether they should have done the full 61 or whether they should have just gone 37 and be done with it. I don't know. Anyway, we've spent way too much time on this. Yeah, um, yeah, we'll, okay. as I'm sure, as people get you know their hands on these things, we'll we'll see some convincing demonstrations um, of them, and yeah, we might be proved completely wrong. Um, let's move on to this next thing. This this one actually excites me, and it made me feel very old um, for reasons that probably not um, you might not realise first. So. UVI, um, we are big fans of the UVI stuff uh, around these parts, and they've just released Emulation 2 Plus. 
Now, the reason it made me feel old is because I remember when their first emulator libraries came out. We had Emulation 2, and then that was shortly followed by Emulation, which was the Emulator 1 stuff. And they also combined um, the Drumulator sample libraries in both. So you could have um, sample drums and then the sampled sounds, and they did some really good uh, work with um, capturing you know, the, the classic samples from the factory libraries, Plus, they made some some of the new stuff as well. And Emulation 2, I mean, I, I was playing with those, I don't know, 10 years ago? It seems it seems a long while ago. And I was talking to the guys at UVI. I said, oh, wow, this was like the first thing of yours that I really kind of got excited about. And now you've brought this out. And this really combines all of that and more. So Emulation 2 Plus is Emulator 1, Emulator 2, Emulator 3 samples along with um, Drumulator and SP12 stuff. And they've even had the foresight to put the old Oberheim DPX in there. So they've taken... So the, the Oberheim DPX was uh, a play, sample playback machine. So you couldn't do any sampling on it, but you could load uh, EMU emulator discs into it and it would play them back. But it wouldn't do them exactly the same. So there's a switch, and I'll... Let's see if I can bring up the... Because um, I've actually got my copy running here and let's see if I can do this I've never tried this before um, let's see how well this works and what you get on screen and there you go right, so hey. yeah hey look at that <laughs> so this is running in in UVI's Falcon uh, instrument and as you can see I've got it on my favorite patch Mercato strings in the top left hand corner um, let me just bring this over here so I can see it so in the top left hand corner you've got this little DPX button so you basically you, you load the patch and then you can switch between whether you got it playing through the emulator uh, filters I guess or I'm, I'm, I don't think they've emulated the filters but the, the processing for that or through the DPX and they've, they've sampled obviously both and so this one the DPX always sounds a little thinner maybe a little weedier but maybe that's what you like so at least you have the option but um, this is, so you have Emulator 2, um, then you have, let me just find this here, you have Emulation 1, let's pick a patch, just pick an acoustic guitar patch, and as you can see they have these lovely um, scripted front ends, which I think are um, some of the nicest out there, they're very, very nice looking, so you know they're, they're very um, authentic in terms of the styles and the colours and the fonts, so there's, there's an Emulator 1 there. And of course, the new one uh, is the Emulator 3. Um, so they've got a whole bunch of Emulator 3 libraries in there. And they've also now officially licensed the um, OMI Universe of Sounds discs, which were some very uh, well-used uh, third-party libraries. In fact, some of the first ever kind of uh, third-party sample libraries for, for samplers back in the day. And so you've got the Emulation 3, and there is, of course, the, the Drumulator stuff as well but the fun thing about this and let's just open this stuff up here um let's do this one here so that this is the best thing about this and it's the thing i've been focusing on mostly um since i, I got hold of this they've now got this new multi section and the multi section allows you as you can see at the top here you've got a b c and d and drums and effects so you can layer a drum patch with four synth patches from either the, the one, the two, or the three, and some FX. And then you've got arpeggiators, and uh, I think it's a 64-note or 128-note step sequencer in there as well. So you can build your own patterns and loops. In fact, you could probably build an entire song using some of this stuff. And, and this, let's, I'm going to press a key here and hope that it works. But it doesn't because of wasn't I don't know I haven't got the, the audio routed properly. But it's a whole kind of piece there that you can mess around with, and they've got a whole bunch of presets. Uh, as you can see, a lot of them are um, you, they, they hint they hint at uh, the inspiration. So you've got um, Coeur de Glace. So that's a blondie thing if you ever saw one. There's Model One and Model Two, which are very craft work like. Um, there is uh, on video, which um, I forget who that was now, but it's gone out of my head. Um, Small Town, which is B Bronski Beat esque. There's Tainted, which is obviously soft cell like, and a whole bunch of other things. But it's really, really, really good fun. 
Um, should we play? Let's play a demo of some of the patches so that people can actually uh, hear what it sounds like. Um, and then we can talk about how good it is, how close it gets to the real deal. Um, here we go. Let's just share some of this. I need, oh, gee, I need some proper switching gear here somewhere. Right, here we go. So I think that gives us a, a good impression of the, 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 the kinds of sounds that um, Emulation 2 provides. Um, I, I love it. I'm a big Emu fan and this is, I mean, even though I've got some Emu stuff here, I do love playing with it in, in, in this kind of fashion. Ben, um, I know that you, you uh, got a bit excited about this. Yeah. Are you yeah, liking what you hear? Yes. Uh, very much. Uh, back in 1987, right? right when we used to wear an onion on our belt, uh, like, <laughs> like, <laughs> I was I was in uh, Strawberry Studios and we hired in an emulator too. And the D50 had only just come out, I think, uh, and I had a really early release of the D50, which blew me away. I think I had a D50, a DX7, and this emulator too. Oh, it's like a dream uh, team, and, isn't it? And, yeah, <laughs> and. Uh, the, the D50 was like wow you know all that native dance and everything but it was like whoa how, how can we use this in a tune we can't so, alright then we'll, we'll have to move on to the, <laughs> <laughs> the the voice samples the fur like rip offs anyway yeah. this, this this emulator uh, got it all set up and started, I had to because we were in there for a while recording I had to I was sort of bit on my own with a pair of headphones and these two flight cases full of, you know, the big floppies. Uh, and I had to go through the library making notes of which sounds. I wasn't the producer, but I, <laughs> <laughs> I was lumbered with this job of coming up with the sounds that I thought would work in the track and then go back and because it was just too many. So I spent like nights and nights and nights just popping a disc in, waiting for it load, listening to it. And some of them were like amazing. Some of them were like totally useless, and but it, it <laughs> always, it always sounded awesome. I, yeah. I thought like, because I knew it was expensive. I, I wasn't really sure how much it was, but I knew it was expensive because they didn't buy it. You know, the record company didn't buy it; they hired it. So I thought, this isn't like you know, it's not in the same price range <laughs> as this D fifty thing because they've they've only hired it. Right? But um, it, it sounded amazing. And then, like, years, years passed, and, and I went round to somebody's house to buy something else. I can't remember what it was. And he had an emulator, too, there. And it was, like, hooked up to a Mac like the, this thing here, you know, mm. like a little old Mac. And uh, he was managing his presets through that, his samples through that somehow. I don't know how he's doing it. But uh, I had a go of it, and it sounded just as good as, mm. as uh, you know. It, it, so it... It is like a unique machine. I think it, it 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 should it should be recreated. It's whether they can capture that. I can't tell. You know, here like listening to it over the the internet and that. But it's whether they can capture that that quality that it's got. It's yeah. Got a real, even though the samples are a fairly low resolution by today's standards. Well, that adds yeah. something to it. But it's just the 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 oomph to it it's got a real quality about it and it must be the the converters and i don't know whether that that is something that they can replicate in software it, well maybe. all they've done here this is a sample library so yeah. there's there's no uh, fancy modeling stuff going on uh, behind the scenes but that that emulator sound or that emu sound has always been about the filters whether it's the analog filters that were on the one 
and the 2 and the first Emacs. But even the digital filters on the Emacs 2 and the E3 were still better sounding than some analog filters. They were just, there was something about Rossum's designs that were just really yeah. great, um, you know, in terms of his, uh, his, his machines. Um, but what a time to be alive now, because I remember it wasn't too long ago when, you know, before I even got a Fairlight in here, that I was hankering after Fairlight sounds, after emulator sounds, after all these classic sampler libraries, and there wasn't much about. And now we have this, we have Arturia's Emulator 2, uh, we've got software versions of the Fairlight out there. You know, all of these libraries are now everywhere and, and lots of people are loving them and using them, rightly so. Um, let's go to, to Mel, because Mel and I share a passion, or certainly um, he used to share a passion uh, for the Fairlight. Um, were you ever an emulator guy or was it always just the Fairlight? And what do you think of this? Well, I uh, well, you know, we were both around in 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 the eighties. I don't really have a great desire to go back there, to be honest. Um, I, I I never played with 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 it. actually no. I was about to say I never played with any emu gear. The, the only two things I ever used in the studio was an emu modular, which mm -hmm. didn't belong to me, and a drum emulator that we hired um, because we couldn't get a Lindrum on that particular day. I thought the drum emulator was great. I mean, so punch, massive, mm -hmm. massive aggressive sound i really like that the emu stuff uh the one i missed completely i think i played it in a in a, in a shop and it was the first sample that i ever played and i think i bought a tin and a couple of string sounds the two i think i was on the fairlight by, by then you know, when, when was that 85 86 what the series three was 85 yeah oh was it okay i mean it was yeah it kind of passed me by because i because i got into the Fairlight as um, a programmer, not you know, not as an owner at uh, that stage. Mm. So that, so that, that, that was my world. But it's funny when you play the demo, you're immediately, you know, you're taken back, aren't you? you know? And yeah. you start thinking of some really great pop records like um, I don't know, Pet Shop Boys, yeah. or, you know, or, or I mean, great sounding records like um, you know, New Order, for mm. example. No, I, I wouldn't like to say what they used on separate tracks, but you know, so many videos or live performances you, you seem banging away at. Um, well, anyway. there's that there's that classic um, performance of them when they did new uh, Blue Monday. I'll say New Monday. Yeah, they yeah. did Blue Monday on top of the pops live, which had never been, you know, certainly a band with that amount of technology. And Stephen Morris is at the back with an emulator one or the emulator, as it was known, banging that stuff there. And he was swapping discs over. And I think at one point he put the wrong disc in. And when he presses the key to trigger one sound, it triggers something else. And they all kind of look at each other and go, because um, mm -hmm. they just, yeah, it was just, you know, it was, they had balls to do that back then. I mean, you know, we wouldn't yeah. dream of doing it nowadays. But oh, I would. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. there you go. Well, we did. But, you know, yeah, not quite. <laughs> You had to back then, um, didn't you? I mean, nowadays yeah, it's you I mean, can just load load everything up into a big multi and then just just flick through them. But yeah, but you can uh, still make mistakes. Like yeah, if you can't be bothered learning a song in a different key and you've got your presets transposed, and then you call up the wrong preset but play the right parts, <laughs> it doesn't sound very good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Happy but, accident sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's still, I mean, still though, I mean, I've got this, I've got the, the, the Arturia uh, emulator plug-in, but I still, I mean, I've got a couple of Emacs's and I bought those primarily so I could play genuine Emu samples or Emulator 2 samples through an actual Emu built machine. And they do sound, there is something about that sound. Even, even when you just sample anything into there, it's so easy and quick to do. And the sound is so satisfying. It, it has a quality all of its own, which, you know, is what the Fairlight, you know, the Series 2 Fairlights had a quality uh, mm. all of their own. Um, but um, even so, I still desperately, desperately want an emulator 2 mm. at some point in my life. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know one that's in the Thames. In the Thames? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, you... yeah. I'll get it. Check, check <laughs> for scuba gear. <laughs> I could tell you what bridge it's by as well. So, somebody was driving me home once, and years and years ago from, um, from a, a Lily Art session, and they um, they um, happened to tell me that um, they were so unhappy with their emulator that they 
threw it over a bridge. Wow. So if you've got <laughs> a Georgia, you can probably free one. Yeah. I'm not sure what kind of condition. It's been there for 30 years, though. It's kind of like uh, the Rick Wakeman story. He got so pissed off with his Mellotron that he took it up to the hill and set it on fire, which is allegedly true. Yeah. Uh, we'll have to ask him one day. Um, Chris, I, are you much of a, a sample, you know, 80 sample guy? Does this sort of thing appeal to you? <laughs> Uh, probably not as much as you guys. I don't have as much of the emotional connection to it, but I do like the sound of the emulator. Uh, so far, I, I got the uh, was it the Chroma, the EV, yes. uh, UVI Chroma. This mm -hmm. week it was nineteen bucks, so yeah, uh, picked that up. And I don't have too much UVI stuff yet, but I, I really liked it. The workflow was a lot better than you know things like Contacts. So, um, and it had good sound, you know. Uh, yeah. So with this, I I have the Arturia version of the emulator which i really like mm -hmm. and it would it'd be a tough sell to get me to change from that because i thought it sounded really good yeah so i don't know no it's uh, i i mean for the price as well this this thing is um really good value for money because the list price is 199 which is not bad for what you get but at the moment it's 129 and i'm told that if you have either emulation one or emulation two or both then you do get a discount. And somebody did say, and don't quote me on this, but I did read somewhere that someone said that I'd got emulation one and emulation two, and they got this for 59 quid. So you get all of that for 59. It's not bad mm. at all. Um, and there's a, there's a ton of stuff. I mean, as ever, uh, with UVI's material, uh, where are we? Let's get this here. So 11.24 gig of losslessly encoded samples, basically 21.2 20, um cramped down into 11.24 but losslessly so it's good quality over 1300 presets um and you can uh use this across three three machines so if you have a desktop and a laptop and you know maybe something else you can uh, authorize this and have three versions of it running uh, across different machines and um yeah what runs on falcon as, as we saw but also runs on their free uvi workstation uh, which is you know is really good, and it has a lot of their um, their own effects built in, and lots of ways to to mess around with those samples uh, and sounds in there. And they have sampled all of this stuff directly through the original hardware, so it's 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 very good. Maybe not as as useful as maybe having the kind of programmable version that Arturia do, but certainly the um, the extensive sounds on here are. Are very useful so that's available now from uh, uvi.com priced at 129 euro right shall we bring in an old classic uh not no not mel not just yet um we've got one more old classic to bring in here um we, we can't really there's not much to to kind of go on at the moment but roads are coming back now i'm not privy to the exact details of um how this came to, ha to to be because basically Rhodes uh what's the full name of the business Rhodes Music Limited is now based in of all places the um the very exotic Leeds uh in Yorkshire in in England Aye. yeah um so I don't quite know how that all happened there is a story behind it but maybe we'll find out some more we are going to try and see if we can get somebody on from the new uh, the new roads company at the moment the website is nothing but a registration page where you can uh, get uh, regular emails with updates of what's going on and th those have kind of ramped up in the last few days so I'm I'm expecting something to appear very soon um but you know the Fender Roads is such a classic instrument it's got this wonderful tone uh, it's it's been on so many hit records and many non-hit records it's just an incredible iconic instrument that you know many people have tried to sample but it's not quite the same as having the real deal there and now we're being promised a what looks like a brand new physical hardware roads not a software emulation or maybe there is another one maybe there's something coming along because they've said they're going to do a range of things but certainly it looks like they've got a full-size fully functional mechanical roads does that excite anyone in the room here is anybody <laughs> not not enough to spend any money um, <laughs> but it, it, I, I like the fact that they're making them again i think like uh, and uh, there's not much information out there as we as you've said like but the bits that you can see it looks as though 
we're talking a quality instrument you know it's not like it's not like bits of tape and chewy holding things together it's, yeah it, it looks really well made the bits that you can see and i think that's the thing with the road stuff isn't it if they get that right they, they, they've nailed it because it's the experience of uh, of playing one it's not it's not just the sound a big part of it is the sound but for a player it, it, it's mm -hmm. you know it's, it's nice to get that sound from that instrument not from a controller keyboard but back in the day when when the roads was the you know the shiz as the kids say and the only way you could get the road sound was to have a roads a fender roads or whatever on stage and you know and three men to lug it around nowadays we can get pretty darn close with mm. modeled roads you know software roads mm -hmm. or sampled roads mm -hmm. is there a marketplace is there going to be a big enough marketplace to have a genuine fender roads is it just going to be wealthy collectors or you know is it going to be a luxury item is it or is it going to be a viable instrument that can be taken out and gigged i don't know what do you think mel I think it's. I think it's. I think it's very brave, and I think it's it's welcome, you know, as a, as a, to have an instrument, any instrument, and and that's as as um as you said, it's a real a real player's instrument. I was never I was never a Rhodes guy. Actually, I always preferred the Wurlitzer, and if Wurlitzer made one, I'd I'd be on the list tomorrow because I've been looking for one. <laughs> but you know, I guess you've just got to think about you know as as you said, the amount of people to carry it. It's, it's it's a long way from the sequential take five. Right? Well, quite, yes. And, uh, you also got to tune it. I was talking to a friend of mine who played in a rock band in the 70s, back with UFO, and he told, and he was a Wurlitzer player, and he said, you know, we had to carry at least two because mm. of broken reeds and tuning every night, you know. Yeah. Um, so um, that kind of thing is... Uh, kind of a lost art now but you know, yeah you know I mean, it's going to create it's, it's, a few jobs isn't it yeah oh, absolutely and that's that's good if it means you know some some real quality instruments are being built then that that's yeah. good but you know, you see mellotron let's take a mellotron for example um you can still you can still buy proper fully mechanical mellotrons or you can buy these digital mellotrons that are the same size as just a regular synthesizer mm -hmm. and do the same thing and sound very very close to the you know sound close enough as, as most people would ever want or you can just have one on a laptop and mm -hmm. you know the, the horror stories of mellotrons being toured as you said you know they probably had to take two or three and all of this you know the spare parts and tapes would snap and motors would burn out and, and all sorts of things so is there going to be a market for I just don't know what do you think Chris <laughs> I, I hope there is. I'm glad that they're doing this. Uh, I, I like what Ross said in the uh, in the chat. Where are we going, Marty? We don't need no roads, but uh, but we we do want them though, don't we? Uh, it, yeah, it is going to be expensive, and I think it is something that it, you know it's not going to be um, you know a, a big production type of thing. I can't see a whole lot of people buying them, but. For the ones that don't do want it, it'll be nice to have that in the market. I know that there's uh, what's the other company that's doing it right now? Is it Vintage Vibe that has a really beautiful road style yeah, electric I think piano? So, yeah, yeah. Um, those look gorgeous, and every time I see one of those, man, it's like serious gut gear lust. But I, I totally don't need it. And uh, we were watching, uh, my wife and I were watching the uh, Luke Cage. Uh, series, the Marvel series, uh, yep. last year I think, and in the the upper part of the the office part of the bad guy lair, they have a, a a Rhodes in there and played it quite a bit on the series, and oh man, just that again this experience of of sitting at one, but yeah, for for recording, we've got so many good options. I mean, a lot of times I just pull up if I'm you know trying to get something down, I pull up the Logic. Um, electric piano, yeah, and yeah. I, I, it, I'm able to dial it in and get the tones that that I need. It's not the same experience. Uh, my buddy brought over a Yamaha. I think it's the CP88. Mm -hmm. What's the new like? Yeah, 88 key. Yes, yeah, piano yeah, yeah, yeah. organ. Yeah. Uh, so you know that experience of those keys and everything else is is quite a bit different, even, even from something like this, which is a pretty you know luxury synth. It does have a different feel, but I, I hope that I hope they do well. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I don't. I don't wish them any ill. And if you want to um, keep up with what they're doing, then you can go to their website and sign up. They've also got a Facebook page. They posted this brilliant little video here with the wonderful. I love Patrice Russian. This I oh, just. Oh, she makes me go all funny. Um, so she's playing at the road. She's talking about the what you know what she's doing with the roads um, or what she did with the roads back in the day. So you can sign up there and and get information from them via the social media. But I'm hoping we're going to hear something very very soon judging by the 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 phrasing and the tone of their their weekly emails it seems to be uh, something is brewing um which is always good um yeah. the, the other one, one more thing the other thing i wanted to say was i've got some friends that uh you know just i i met online that uh are moog one users and we've kind of kept in touch and and one in particular, and he has his Moog One sitting on top of a Rhodes. That's the Moog One stand. I'm like, that's the Moog One stand that I want, but yeah. I don't think I can make it happen. <laughs> that's going to be one heavy stand as well. I was going to say, them legs yeah. must have some strength in them, must yeah. Because the Rhodes isn't light. Absolutely. <laughs> anyway, there we go. As um, soon as we hear something from Rhodes, um, we'll we'll bring it to you on the show and um, and say hopefully we'll we'll try and get hold of some of them in Leeds because they're in the same time zone as, as as us. It should be good. I'm, I'm hoping they'll be wanting to do some promo, so maybe we get some inside information. Um, right, I think now's the time we should actually get into talking to our guest, um, Mr. Mm. Mel Wesson. Um, I. I could go through, I mean, I was looking, doing a bit of research, looking through your biography, and it's a, uh -huh. it's a, a long and extensive and very rich uh, history that you have, and one that's still going on to this very day. Um, so what I want to know is, and this might take a very long while, how did the, the man who has worked on the very latest James Bond movie that hopefully is coming out in cinemas very, very soon, how did you get there from starting off at your day job in the late 1970s at Rod Argent's oh. store on Denmark Street. I mean, that's a that's a real kind of rags-to-riches tale, surely. That's the 30-second answer. That, that <laughs> one, that was actually really easy. No, but, let, but let's, let's just spin it out. Let's right? start at the beginning, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, Argent's was great for me because I, <clears throat> I was at art school and I told my parents I wasn't going to go on any further and they swore at me and said, you've got to get a job. <laughs> I was actually working on a um, building site when I saw the ad for Argent. So I, mm. got, I went for it, you know, when I really needed this job. I was looking for anything. I was looking for a gig with a band or working in a studio. But this, this, this came up. And I got it. And I, I think I was there two or three weeks before the store even opened, you know. Mm. So we were painting this wonderful shade of brown and sticking <laughs> cork tiles. This, this was the 70s. You know? Yeah. Cork tiles, brown cork tiles, and brown carpet, you know. So when, when it opened, you know, we were, everything was coming out of, out of the boxes. And it was, it was a fantastic time. I think it was 19, right? maybe 20. 19. Yeah. It was absolutely brilliant time. But Argent's was so much more than a shop. It was kind of like a community. It, very, very quickly. Um, it became this 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 sort of living, breathing community of friends, you know. And um, it wasn't just people that came in and out of the shop. Denmark Street was 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 exactly like that. Mm. All the guys. There was a lot of guitar shops there. There were a lot of studios there. And we all used to buy our sandwiches in the Giaconda, and we used to drink at the pub at the end of the road. So everybody got to know every every everybody else. And you know, at, at that time, I I think I I felt no, I don't know. I, I had a synth. I had a Korg 700, which I which I bought with my, you know, earnings digging holes in the ground and stuff. And um, and that was my knowledge. And and I was the salesman. But I you know I didn't know anything about sales. <laughs> and and there we were with this shop full of synths. So you know, it was it was this incredible learning curve. I remember when the System 700 came in. I I took the manual home. I was still living with my mum and dad. And every night I take it home on a train to Croydon. And, and I just lie in bed reading this thing. Then next day I'd go back and try something out. And one day I was trying something out, and this, this German guy who I'd seen in the shop a few times came in, and he learned over my shoulder. He said, why were you all here? And I was, what, are, what, what, what are you doing there? And I made some comment. He said, well, you should try this. And I said, would you like to buy one? He said, I've already got one. Of course, that, 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 that was Hans Zimmer, you know? So... <laughs> So we 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 became you know 
Bobby has been, I've known Hans for over 40 years now. So yeah. that was how I got to James Bond because of course Hans, Hans did James Bond. But that's kind of the easy version. Um, but, you know, Argent's was, it was, as I said, it was so much more than a shop. And probably within about a year, I was doing sessions. I was doing programming sessions up, up and down the street. Yeah. And it kind of helped that I also by that time had the keys to the shop. So, <laughs> so if we wanted a profit, you know, hey yeah. guys, one one careful owner, you know. So you know, it, so that that was that was a really cool time, a really creative time. And, yeah. You know, it it, it, it was you know, people like Hans. When Hans wasn't doing anything much in those days, he was getting into jingles. He 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 was in a rock band um, called Krakatoa. So, you know, there was people starting off. There were, you know, huge, huge names. Like, and Jimmy Page was like a, you know, regular mm-hmm. at the time. I think it was around the time they were recording Presents. He started coming in. And then we got um, John Paul Jones as GX1 in. And, wow. You know, people started working. But I think one of the guys from the shop ended up working for Led Zeppelin and, and then had a nervous breakdown. You know, you know, <laughs> easy come, easy go. And, um, yeah, I guess that that was where everything started, you know. And 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 I've got some lifelong friends from them. I mean, not just Hans. I mean, Ed 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 from Node. Ed Ed from Node right, used to yeah. come in and you know uh, play play the gear, and you couldn't get him out of the shop, you know. <laughs> but then I remembered only a few months before I got the gig there, they couldn't get me out of Macari's around the around around the corner. But they right, yeah. they they had rather kind of more. Um, uh, efficient methods of removing people. <laughs> I, I never got it. I was talking to, uh, I think it was Ken online. I honestly never got past 30 minutes, I don't think. No, but I think th- <laughs> those of us of a certain generation, that's what we did. I mean, I remember in the early 1980s, so I was obviously, uh, you know, a, s- a slightly different generation, but I would go into music stores, and particularly at the time, I was very into drums and. And so I would go in and I'd pester the guys and I'd say, how do, how do Adam and the Ants get that really kind of wet tom-tom sound? That really, yeah, and, and we would talk this and then they'd get peed off with me because they've got pay, actual paying customers. You know, I never had the money to, to buy anything for a long, long time. But it was just the way it was. These, Like you say, they, they were communities of, yeah. it was like the gathering place for musicians. And if you were lucky, you met someone else who maybe you, you hit it off with uh, musically and these friendships and, and working yeah. relationships were formed. And then, you know, we had, we had place, you know, we had customers, we had pe- people that were working in um, Strident Studios, for example. Right, we, yeah. We, we were, we were two, two or three blocks around the, around the corner. Yeah. So you'd take gear around, around there and you'd meet people. I mean, Flood, Flood was, a, mm. um, you know, Flood's career started there. Yeah. Um, as did uh, Al, Al Clay that, that worked with Hanson as a producer. I guess of... being in London, that really is kind of like the yeah. Certainly for the UK, that was like that was yeah. ground zero. That's if you were working in Denmark Street yeah. uh, or around there, you got to see and meet and talk with all these people. I mean, I didn't realise it at the time. I didn't realise it when I got the job. I just saw it was a keyboard store, and, and then of course it was Rod Argent, and you know Rod Argent yeah. hadn't been out of Argent that that long, you know. No. So ev- everything was you know all all of a sudden you 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 kind of went from. It being in quite a provincial, actually, I I grew up in Croydon, which had a phenomenal music scene, mm. incredible music scene, but it was still just just that you know small town really, and then all of a sudden you were thrown into the middle of that, and then the marquee was only just down the road from mm-hmm. Trident, so you know I'd be getting home later and later at night, and <laughs> sometimes sleeping in the shop, you know, <laughs> and miss the train and all that kind of stuff. So it it, it was um. Yeah, I mean, I just lived it and breathed it for you know two or three years, and two or three yeah. years I, the, the, um, I was working there, and um, so that was where every every everything started. Every, yeah. Everything started there, and, it, uh, and we, we still we still talk about Argent. Yes, oh, it's 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 it's, it's legendary. It's just, it is the stuff of legend. I mean, I uh, I kind of. I, because have you been around there recently, around Denmark Street, yeah. since they've started redeveloping? Well, it's it's really awful. I mean, yeah. It is. And I was trying to, I took my kids there and I said, look, I remember walking down this street and seeing, you know, Argent's and, you know, the times of Macari's and there was Turnkey around the corner as well. And all these great shops yeah, that you could yeah. just go in and see everything that you ever wanted. And, you know, we, and we, used to, we, we used to stand in the shop and, 
um, op- opposite the shop was this place called the Tin Pan Alley Club, which we, yeah. I, I, I never went in there. And it was like, you know, real kind of, you know, dodgy Soho characters, you know, West, West <laughs> End of London characters. And behind there was where the Sex Pistols started, started rehearsing. That's it. And all that, yeah. You know, occasionally you, 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 you'd see these real Herberts hanging in the street. And, it, you know, we were still long haired in those days. And, oh, what's going on here? What's this? <laughs> so all kinds of things. And actually, Keith Levine, who ended up playing in Public Image, was a very early Argent, um, I wouldn't even say customer, because he, he had no money. You know, he, he would just come in and he would make. You know the most unbelievable noises, and these incredible noises, and you just go, oh, you know, this is not sure I can stand another hour of Keith, but he was such a lovely guy, <laughs> and so enthused, you know, so enthused by having access and making these sounds. Yeah. And it actually did make a refreshing change from somebody coming in and playing like George Duke riffs and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. But one day Keith came in after we'd known him for like a year. And he goes, right, I'll have that, I'll have that, I'll have that, I'll have, I'll have that. And we thought he was joking. He's, no, no, seriously, I've just joined this band, which was Public Image. Wow. So he then walks out with like bucket loads of gear, you know, <laughs> which he then made some incredible noises and made, and made some great. But I'd love to know I haven't seen actually. I haven't yeah. seen. I used to see him around quite, quite a lot in those days. I haven't seen him since I left yeah. the shop. But um, you know, so it, it it wasn't an elitist place, and it and it and it wasn't just full of rock stars and you mm. know wannabes and all. That. It was a real mixture. It was a yeah. real mixture. Yeah. So after your time at Argent, you went off to play in the band. How did that work? Great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> did you tell me you toured with the Polyfusion? Yeah, I did. Actually, this this was um, with a guy called T.V. Smith, who was in a band called The Adverts. Mm-hmm. And they had a sort of, you know, an amount of success and, um, with Crossing the Red Sea with the adverts and uh, Bored Teenage was a single, I think, Gary Gilmore's mm-hmm. Eyes. So this was, the, this was the, the next band and there was a lot of expectation about that and, and we failed on all fronts. <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, we, we like got a record deal with a sort of subsidiary of CBS who, you know, we tried to, I think they called it Kaleidoscope and they tried to make it looked like it was an indie label but it was still like in solo mm. square you know? and, but it, it was great it was some of the best days of my life to be perfectly honest yeah. we, we, I did exactly what I wanted to do and, and I, I had no pressure and no stresses like you know we just went out and we played every night and or, or, or we tried to play every night but we, <laughs> we toured a lot and we, we, we finally after six week residency at the Fulham Greyhound when we first went there we were getting like 20 people a night and the last gig we had like 50, 60 people couldn't get in, you know. It wasn't a big place, we 200, 200, 300 people. And then we got a deal out of out of that. And then we made a record and then promptly the band fell apart like, <laughs> within a few months. You know. The record didn't sell and you know, everybody hated us so, on that. Oh, and we got thrown off the undertones. So right. Never quite forgiven Fergal Sharkey for that, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> um, and, and when I was back at Argent's, Two years later, working a couple of days a week, he came in, and I was—I was, I wasn't exactly polite. Or something like that. Well, he, everybody you. has off days, right? Indeed, absolutely. <laughs> so that, so that, that was how that happened. You know, yeah. that, that was that kind of circle. And um, uh, I was say, yeah, I was say um, after that, you know, what what because you then became known as um, you know a Fairlight expert. You you were working well, at Hans's studio at Lilliard. How before that, that well, before that, actually, as 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 you did mention, by the way, yeah, I did, I did tour with this with this band, this sort of new wave band with this with this polyfusion system, which is just brilliant. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's such a great. There's one for sale at the moment, and I wish I wish I could I wish I could fund it because it's rather expensive. But mm. one of the greatest and underrated polyfusions in my humble yeah. um, um, modulars in my humble yeah. phenomenal synth. But anyway. Uh, after that, I tried a couple of years unsuccessfully to get uh, bands with some friends of mine off of, off of the uh, off the ground, you know, with <clears throat> a couple of people from a band called UK Subs and a couple of people from an aptly named band called Wasted Youth, mm-hmm. and uh, one of which is no longer with us. He's really sad, but, but you know, we we tried all kinds of things. EMI were really interested at one point, but. Um, when I when I when I write my book, I, I'll see why we didn't get that one because that was <laughs> that was quite a spinal tap. But I was in Charing Cross Road, staring in the window of Turnkey, 
looking at all these things that I couldn't possibly afford. When Hans turned, Hans walked along and tapped me on the shoulder and he said, no, what, what are you up to? And I immediately said, oh, the band's broken up. And before I could finish his sentence, he said, do you know how Fairlight works? <laughs> no. <laughs> do you want to know how Fairlight works? Yes, you know. Well, I just bought one and here's the thing. As it transpired, his engineer was a guy called Steve Rance, who was an you know, incredibly yeah. talented engineer and a great Fairlight guy who ended up moving to Australia and working for Fairlight. So Hans had the Fairlight in Lily Yard, which was a great, you know, it, 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 it brought people in, you know, it brought people through the through uh, the front door. So Hans said to me, look, what I wanted to do, I, I want to concentrate on, on writing for film. And I, I had no idea how that went for him, but maybe it's worked out. <laughs> but I can't afford to not have the Fairlight working because the Fairlight was almost earning as much as a studio was earning just to hire in those days. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. it was the price of a house to, to you know, an apartment to buy, you know, a series two. So I ended up doing two weeks work for Stanley Myers. I, I literally took Hans's keys. I went back to the studio. And several nights I slept there and, you know, I lived and breathed this thing for two weeks to get two weeks work. Mm. And I ended up freelancing there for about five years. <laughs> was running the running the, the fair light. We moved over to a series three. Yeah. Well, you know, it was a massive, massive step. And, it, and, 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 and again, it was just this no, no plan. You know, it was just this evolution. Of one thing led to another. Um, and you know it, we made a lot of really terrible records and some really good ones and i met actually i met a producer called mike hedges i'm still in touch with he's a really lovely guy and a really talented man with great ears and we did some Susie in the Banks tracks with the fair light and we ended up with two at one point wow. you know sync tough and it was mm. fantastic <laughs> and i think soul to soul came in there did a little bit with that and, and, it, and then I ended up buying it when, when I ended up buying the Fairlight um, for far less than Hans paid for it when Hans went to LA. I think that was 91, something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, then, yeah. and then sold it. Because <laughs> everybody wanted time stretching, you know. Everybody, everybody yeah. really wanted, and also it was, it was bankrupt and me moving the damn thing yeah. around. You know, it was flight case. And, and I, I just wanted to pick, a, you know, pick up a this and that and you know my little rack of gear and so i so i bought an akai 3200 which i actually think is a, you know I, that was a fantastic machine i, I you know I, I much prefer that to the emis sorry no, no <laughs> I, I really love that machine yeah. and that was a machine that i that i did um uh, urban hymns on right the, the verve yeah yeah which i found the uh which I found the disc for Bittersweet Symphony recently. Oh, I've wow. got nothing to play it on, you know. It was a, um, um, what, do you, what do you call it, you know? Uh, I have. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, we have. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, so, I, we, should, we should all up about this. Yeah, we should, absolutely. <laughs> I would love to know what's on that uh, drive, actually, because it, it looks yeah. like it's got all the, all, the, all the good stuff on it. And, yeah, it, and it is, it, it's the only one. I promise you, it's the only one. Yeah, I bet. Wow. <laughs> yeah, they are, they're, they're, it's wonderful. It's wonderful when you find that stuff, isn't it? The the historic. Yeah. I mean, I <clears throat> excuse me. When I dig through, you know, we we get fairlights in here. When you dig through, and uh, when we had Ian Stanley's fairlight in, um, it was just flicking through, and there's Tears for Fears stuff in there. There's yeah, Lloyd it. Cole and the commotions. You think this is it? There 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 are no copies of this anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's it's quite magical moments. It's kind of like having the master tape, isn't it? Yeah. It's like one step before yeah. the master tape. Yeah, absolutely. Such an important part. Yeah. Such an important part. So, um, 90s. Verve, yeah. um, you did some stuff with youth as well. Yeah, youth was really... I really enjoyed working with, with, with him. In the early 90s, I worked with... Um, yeah, I, it, was, it was a fair light thing, and then we moved to Battery and... Did a lot of stuff with a sort of little production team up there. I can't honestly say it was, you know, the most. Looking back, <laughs> actually, even at the time, you know, it, it it was it was work, you know, and we we had fun, but it it was quite limiting. I started to find it very very limiting, and um, I tried to get into uh, production, but that's just so hard. You know, you were labelled as as, uh, as as you know, oh, he's he's just a programmer. It was really hard to break out. 
Mm. And I then got management who put me in a studio with uh, Youth, who was just a sort of sonic anarchist, really. Yeah. That's who he is. <laughs> and yeah. I, learned, I learned a lot from him, an, an awful lot, which um, kind of, I think, changed my approach to making music. You know, it, it, he's, he's got a much more anarchic throw it at the wall and see what happens. And, it, you know, it doesn't matter if it doesn't work. Let's just, at least we've been there. You know, yeah. sorry, we've been there and we've tried it. Um, so that 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 was uh, I can't remember what what I did with him actually. He did a lot of lot of stuff for his Dragonfly label mm -hmm. in his studio in Brixton at the time. Uh, Butterfly, Butterfly Studio, and uh, yeah, one thing led to another. And at the end of the nineties was about as good as the end of the eighties. It was, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it was oh, now what? You know, if you can't miss it, done that. And on on uh, New Year's Day two thousand, as I'm contemplating my future, my my little girl walked up the stairs with the phone, and she's talking to somebody. You know, it's obviously for for me, and I would you know whatever you know. She said, oh yeah, you know. And after about five minutes, oh, it's somebody called Hans. It was very similar to that tap on the shoulder, you know, 15 years yeah. earlier. And um, I said, oh, well, you know, not a lot. But right, right. How would you like to do the new Tom Cruise movie? Which was Mission Impossible 2. And of course, I, I, I said yes. And, and then I went out there and, and I found myself staring out the window of, of this trailer on... I think it was a Paramount lot or something, like three days later, with Tanks and Tom Cruise and John Woo. And it was like, this is absolutely ridiculous. And I'm literally staring out the the window, like daydreaming. I can't believe this is actually happening. When when somebody asked me a question about this bike chase that I've not been looking at. And, and like, whatever <laughs> I said, it was the right thing, you know. And it was, oh, man, that's great. Let's do it. Let's do it. Oh, I don't know what I said. So, you know, and, and it kind of carried on from that. And I actually thought MI2 would be the only movie that I would ever ever do out there. And then Hannibal came along, mm. which was a massive, massive game changer for me. That was 20 years ago. Now. Right. And that, that, that set like a whole new career path for me. Very, very different things from, from mm. then on. And, you know, for once I actually started taking things a lot more seriously <laughs> <laughs> and and you know i was start, I, n I never really had a plan still don't really have a do I look like a guy with a plan yeah uh, <laughs> and, and one thing kind of led to another but th th there was some kind of thought behind it and there was some sort of loose youth type structure i i, I, I suppose and that's mm. where uh, i you know the ambient music design thing was uh, born so so you kind of you transitioned from uh, a musician to a programmer to uh, this this kind of ambient music designer title that seems to have been thrust upon you. Um, what what does an ambient music designer do? I mean, is it as simple as what it says? You design ambient music, or what's the what's the role of an ambient music designer oh. within you know a movie score? Right. Well, after I did it at MI two, which is very much like a like a band. I mean, Hans is. Hans likes to collaborate with um, uh, people. He's well known for that, and uh, he's um, he's really good at delegating. You know? He's really good at finding people to do certain jobs. And, and you know, um, you know, Ron, Ron Howard, the um, director. Ron Howard came out. I think we were doing Da Vinci Code, and he walked into Hans' studio expecting to find Hans, and there's like 17 people in here. He's like, "Wow, what's going on?" <laughs> and Hans said, oh, this is Mel, he does this, this is, you know, Martin Tillman, he plays cello. Blah, blah, blah. And Ron sat there and he thought about it, he said, okay, this is like a bank job, isn't it? Right? So you've got the getaway driver, and you've got the mastermind, and you've got the safe cracker, you know, and it's like, that's exactly how it works. Yeah. So to just <laughs> recapping to Hannibal, Hans called me up and he said, look, what I want you to do is to become the presence of Hannibal Lecter within this movie. So what I want you to do is to create these textures and things that work within the score or stand alone without the, without the score or sometimes are buried and sometimes pop in and out. But there's this constant presence. Mm -hmm. And I said yes, and then I had no idea how to actually do this. Oh. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> 
what else do you do? Yeah. So I started looking into things, and, and you know, the I don't even think we were on the net then. You know, I might have had a Hotmail account. That's about mm. it. But um, I heard about this thing called medicines, which is still a big, big thing of mine. And, and I was really was attracted by two things. Right. The first thing is it took me back to my art school days because you could draw. You know, you would, the input on the image synth is you, you draw. Uh, volumes of filters and stereo images and pictures and all kinds of things. That's it. There you go. And they've just got the CTX version, which is completely fab. And that really appealed to me. The other thing that really appealed to me is everybody I spoke to said, you'll never get a good sound out. I don't know anybody that's ever got a good sound out. Of it. I thought, well, the gauntlet's down now. You know, let's, let's just go for it. <laughs> so, I, so, I, so I ran hands up and said, look, okay, how about this? How about, how, about, how about this? And he said, "Yeah, great, great, great. Come over." And he said, "He said you've 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 got six weeks." I said, "Okay." I said, "What if it doesn't work after six weeks?" He goes, "Well, we well we try," and I, and you can't say fairer than that. And and that's very much like a, you know, that resonated with me. That reminded me of uh, youth. You know, throw at the wall. Yeah. At least at least we tried it. You know? So I spent six weeks. And recorded all kinds. Mean, this is Hannibal, right? So the first thing that we re re recorded was plates and cutlery. And, you know, yeah. It, I mean, the man is a gourmet here. So, you know, yeah. it was nice plates and nice cutlery as well. So we recorded all this stuff, put it into medicines, and started to make to make things, you know, um, hits and drones and textures and ambiences. And that was the beginning, I suppose, of the ambient music design. Mm -hmm. uh, world, you know, where where we're kind of dancing on the edge of music, and it's somewhere in between music and conventional sound, mm -hmm. uh, sound uh, design, and that that was the that was the idea of it. Um, I always felt it was anchored in music, far more than sound design. It was maybe abstract music. It was always music, and I always looked at it from a from a composition point. Right. Point of view. So, actual making of all these sounds, which I still do now. You know, I, I still, when I start a project, I still spend ages in a catalog, getting stuff together and making these sounds. That's only the, the beginning, and, and where it really starts for me is when I start creating music with those sounds. Right. You know, so it's like kind of creating your own library. You know? mm -hmm. In fact, it's it's creating your own library for a given project. Mm. So that's how the whole thing came um, together. And um, originally, um, I think we titled it Ambient Music, and then somebody in the legal department said, oh, let's put a design on the end there, just in case. You know. <laughs> and uh, and it's, it's been kind of good for me, because it, it, cause it was a unique title. And, and I quite, sometimes I find it harder to explain in some projects than others. And I've actually seen other people use that title from time to time and i'd love to ring them up and say what exactly do you mean by this because because we sort of invented it hence i kind of in, in, um, invented it and it's never an easy thing to um mm. to pin down you know yeah. but it but i think what's been good good about that is there is there are no rules you know uh so and in a lot of projects has been the luxury of time so I can use all of this stuff, you know, the, the EMS, for example. God, it's backwards, isn't it? <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> the, um, the EMS, for example, you know, everybody knows, well, in most people know the EMS since the EMS. It's yeah. been around for 50 years and never get the same sound twice. And it's always this unpredictable sound creation machine. I mean, that medicine to, together to begin with, you know, that, there's a whole world with just those two uh, machines. And, you sort of have to draw yourself back from it, mm. you know, because you you you'll go on forever and ever. It's it's not just medicine. I mean, you know, the the whole ambient music thing grew beyond that. You know, and it grew into all kinds of things that you know, rhythms and pulses, and which led me to library music, production music. Right. But I suppose you know one. I suppose the first time that I ever did something that was really rhythmic was the uh, was the back flats as long valve mentioned mm -hmm. to me earlier. You say so you've got to talk you've got to mention the back flats. You said you <laughs> and the back flats were these sort of, you know, flats to to um um uh, you know to reflect Batman's cat. Right. 
Oh, he's frozen. Oh no! Oh no! We're getting back. Let's. Whoa. So let's see. I, I need to find out what's oh, going on. Oh, he's back! The oh, there we go. There. He's ah. back. He's back. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Keep keep talking uh, about the bat we, flaps. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Cliffhanger there. <laughs> we lost you. Yeah. Like Batman, he just disappeared. Right? That's it. Yeah. I, I did. I did warn Rob that um, that we we've had some power problems. Here. Yeah. Um, so when I when I saw the screen doing this, I thought, right, I'm going to rush uh -oh. downstairs, flick the fuse up, <laughs> send the text to Rob. Okay, stay calm. But yeah, so so the back flaps, yeah, that 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 was a that, that was an, another sort of milestone, I suppose, really. Mm -hmm. And um, and that led well, you know, that led to two more Batman movies. This is brilliant. Yeah. And uh, and a lot more rhythmic work and stuff. So I got much more. You know, so I'm really getting some pulses and textures and you know. Basically, the ambient music is on anything that creates um, an atmosphere. Yeah, you know, and 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 helps tell the tell the story through maybe more abstract sound than than um, just music without being completely literal. You know. Mm. So, where do you draw the inspiration from? Because you're doing some ambient sound design are you working to picture at this point or have you got a script or a treatment that says you know we want something to suit a scene where x and y is happening or this is going on or are you just like taking inspiration from the movie title or what you know what you've been told about it and just coming up with stuff i mean what what feeds you to come up with this stuff for the film i think Originally with Hannibal, Ridley Scott bought to the studio, bought, um, you know, I don't even remember what they were, whether they were etchings, copies of etchings. Right. Um, you know, something like Dante's Inferno type type stuff. Hans, mm. Hans will know and he'll be, you know, correcting me, doubtless. Um, <laughs> with later projects like the Nolan projects, um, I got to go to the set and you know got got to got to watch what was going on and got okay. to walk around Gotham City, which is brilliant, which is just outside Bedford, by the way. <laughs> I, I think it's gone now. Yeah. Gotham, Gotham City was Bedford, really. You know? Lovely. <laughs> and, and we get to read the script. So, like for Inception, um, Inception was super, super, super secret. So I, mm. I, I went to Pinewood and. I read the script, which is printed black on red paper, so you can't photocopy it. Wow. And I was locked in a room. It was taken out the safe. And every now and then, somebody would come in, and they'd see if you wanted a pee or whether you wanted a coffee, and in one end, out the other. You know? <laughs> and so I read this script, and I and I, and, and there were loads of ideas. Obviously, you kind of make notes. You can't mm -hmm. be too accurate. You know, it's text, but just, just ideas, pointers, you know? uh, things about the character. Or things about a place or things about an emotion or in the case of inception it's 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 all about time you know yeah and the way that the different dream dream states react and work with one another so some somehow we had to you know let people know without without putting big signs up you are now in level two you know <laughs> you, you have it's very subliminal so you know all this yeah, most of that came from the script. I think we went actually we did go to the set that yeah. too, which, but 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 we knew what was going on by by then. But mm. but you know all the all that was was really really helpful. So I would then send ideas down the wires to Hans, and he would send bits back, and other people that were involved would maybe send things backwards and forwards, and and then we all meet up in LA. Um, you know when there's picture. By which time, I mean I don't know any of those Batman movies. I was probably creating. Uh, material for, I mean, Dark Knight, I was creating material for six or seven months before I even went to um, LA and right. did anything with it. So it was an enormous amount. But with um, Inception, yeah, the last 10 pages were missing. <laughs> oh God, it doesn't finish like this, does it? Not? <laughs> you know, it's, well, I'm not sure, yeah. But it but it was good and those and those were really good days and I, I really I really really enjoyed those and I really, really enjoyed working with um, Chris and it was really interesting seeing him come from you know I mean Batman was was his first it wasn't his first uh, studio big studio pitch mm. and he hates people saying that but but it was really it was the first big one wasn't it mm. and um, and then he became you know 
Yeah. Mega Scar. Absolutely. So I think the last one I did was, I think it was Inception. Yeah. So, so you, you, you on a. Oh. Uh, uh, sorry, just on, just on a, a more specific level, because I, I'm, I'm finding this very fascinating, and I and I like what you said that uh, about ambient music, that you like it to be music, <laughs> and that's something that's always kind of bothered me about a lot of, uh, you know, a- ambient type stuff that I've I've seen that gets away and it's just sound effect kind of stuff. When you sit down to start making ambient music, and being that you have the 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 mind frame of it's got to be music. How do you get going with that? Where do you start? I mean, very particularly, I mean, Robbie asked you about the uh, inspiration, but like when you sit down to create it, are you starting with a, a rhythm, a tempo, or a particular sound? How does that work for you? It's just an idea. It always starts with, a, with, with an idea, and it, it's more about emotions and concepts really which was sounds very, sounds very very pretentious isn't it but i mean i suppose emotions you know like is it mm-hmm. how how are we going to create i mean for example on, with bane um i did a hot in bane on the dark Knight rises you know we with this this was a new um this was a new character that had a whole backstory and he had this constant pain because of his um you know he was Oh, I didn't remember the backstory. You know, he he, he had the mask with all the pain-killing drugs. And I don't quite remember how he got to that. So, but, you know, mm. he probably spent too many years in the studio with hands. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, he, so it's those kind of things. You know, it, it's more to do with very broad things, and then you just try and narrow them down, and then you try and sit in a room usually by itself, usually in the dark, you know, <laughs> to try and make things happen and make you feel what you want other people to feel. And I think if if you can feel it yourself, then you're sort of halfway there. And if you can't feel it yourself, then you're not kidding anybody, are you? So, mm-hmm. so you so you kind of have to torture yourself a little bit to make it work, I think. And that drives the family crazy and drives me crazy too. <laughs> but you... it's been amazing, amazing fun. Great. Yeah. Do you get given, like, stuff... Uh, that maybe Hans has come up with, uh, or you know, another member of the team has come up with, and they said that, you know, we've got this. This is going to be sitting under this piece. Yes. And do you yeah. then, you know, get to either add stuff to that or use that as an inspiration for for your own thing? Totally, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, when when we did Batman, Batman Begins, the first one, um, initially because that was Hans and James James, James Newton Howard. Mm. I actually ended up doing quite a few things with him as well. I did King Kong with him mm-hmm. and uh, Blood Dime, which are two, 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 you know, well, Blood Dime, too, I love that movie, but you know, King Kong was crazy stories, but that's something <laughs> else. But um, with Batman Begins, we, Hans had some themes, and James had some themes, and we had the bat flaps and some drones and things like that. And when we, and every couple of days, I'd deliver these to Soho Square, where Chris Nolan had a, a, an office at the time with a music editor, and they were piecing things together. I don't think we've seen any picture at that time. Maybe Hans had. I definitely haven't seen any, any anything. So, and actually, Chris tent the entire movie with 15 minutes of this stuff because he didn't want to. He liked what was going on so much in the overall atmosphere of the whole picture that he didn't want to. He didn't want to bring in anything. That was outside that didn't belong in that world you know so um does that answer your question sort of yeah. i suppose yeah. um yeah so yeah i i think the idea is is that no one at that point hides himself in their room and keeps stuff to themselves you know it's every, mm-hmm. everybody shares you know, you've got to yeah. hand your homework in yeah. otherwise you, you get rude phone calls and weird emails where is yeah. this you know <laughs> <laughs> and not everything works you know that, that's okay. You know, yeah. not, not, not everything works, and and then I I get stuck with things myself. I just don't want to hand things over because I can't see it working. And sometimes you hand it over, and, and, and you go, oh, this is great. Sometimes it's like, really, yeah. You know. <laughs> but but it's okay, you know. It's like all all all, all fear and love and war. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Soundtrack. Yeah. A question from the chat actually comes from uh, Ziad, who is the mastermind behind uh, Pulsar Modular, and he asks, since I see that large modular system in the background, 
Can you ask Mel how much uh, does a 914 fixed filter bank get used in his sound design? <laughs> Ah, good question. Mm, um, I use it a lot, actually. It's usually in my chain. You know, if I'm mm -hmm. using, the, using the modules, it's usually, um, you know, it depends what I'm doing. It's usually before or after the filter somewhere in there because it does really enable you to hone in on something. Um, I mean, particularly with the Moog, you know, it's such a big sounding instrument that sometimes you actually just want to take stuff out. So it'll sit with everything else instead of just, you know, completely devastating the entire landscape, you know, the, the whole uh, sonic landscape. Uh, so, yeah, I use it quite a bit. Um, out, out of the box, um, I use GRM tools a lot still. I mean, they've been around for years, but I really like their uh, resonators and various other devices that they that they that they have uh comb filters and stuff mm -hmm. the 914 is great though I've, I've got i've got two i've got one in the 15 which is a which you know someone's going to correct me now of course that's a 907a oh my god you know what do i know <laughs> and um that one's great that one's really good this one i'm going to get the there yep. in the middle of the screen <laughs> that one is really that one's, that's um that system's 1969. It's all labelled at, at the at the back as any bits of taking it back off a mode nice. Um all labelled and hand signed, not by Dr. Bob, but you know. Mm. They're all sixty-nine apart from that one, which is sixty-seven. And I don't know, there's something really special about about that. Mm. It just sounds mm. quite, it just sounds really yeah. good. You can spend hours. Here's the funny thing. Um I've never found a plug in that replicates it. Well that you got you wow. got to try uh, Pulsar Modulars because uh, he okay. does a 914 fixed filter bank. And I've been using it in some of my own recordings. And there's got some a few extra features that are really handy, like a mix. Yeah. And you can do delay offsets for either side, as well as have um, each of the each each of the respective filters go left and right. And so mm -hmm. between some of those features, it's been a really... A, a really interesting way like i've gotten great results on acoustic guitars and things that i wouldn't have normally thought yeah. oh i need a fixed filter bank for my acoustic guitar no but it sounds yeah. great no that that, that 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 sounds really good i mean i'm i'm, I'm not a purist i'm really not i've got all um, this stuff here but you know and i really enjoy playing with it but i i use lots of stuff in the in the in the box and i mean my favorite uh since for the last year has probably been the Waldorf Quantum. I love that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Dave Gessel tells me, you know, uh, before I bought it, Dave, Dave told me it'll, it'll, it'll break windows at like, you know, <laughs> 500 yards. It's lethal. Like, <laughs> so, so brittle sounding. I so I'm in no way kind of wedded to um, to the, you know, to the old gear. Oh, that looks really cool. Can someone yeah. send me a link to that? Yeah, absolutely. We'll, um, yeah, we'll, no, we'll that's, pop that, that across. That's really yeah. good. Yeah, um, really yeah, Ziad uh, sent us uh, a copy of this a, a little while back to, to have a play with him. We've been really impressed with it, particularly Chris has, has put it to some, some very good use. Yeah. So, yeah, well, um, I'll, and uh, uh, also, uh, Ziad had just said he'll give you a copy as well, so we'll, we'll oh, connect oh. you guys up. There yeah, you. yeah, yeah, yeah. We oh, yeah, we'll hook yeah, you up. Thank you. We will hook you up, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Um, because I, I love that whole world of you know, treating things through through this gear, you know, whether it's, you know, old recordings or whether... It, I, mean, I actually play guitar incredibly badly, but I love having a guitar because, I mean, just, just like this stuff, it makes you think differently, you know, and you pick a guitar up and you have to, have to pick and work out what the notes are, you know. Whereas on a keyboard, you sort of know where they are, you know, kind of mm. after after 50-plus years, you sort of know, don't you, you know? <laughs> um, but I love the way that it makes you think differently, and you know, I mean, on my, my I suppose my my go-to for processing is the uh, synth. Thing, you know, mm. off to put a guitar through there or a keyboard or a yeah, you know, put an audio track through. That's that's old school, isn't it? You know, we're going back to you know <laughs> all that. You know, Pete Townsend. You know, this yeah. is really fantastic. Um, uh, our resident uh, expert, Kent Spong, uh, wants to know, is your PPG 300 still working? Ken, I tried to call you last week. <laughs> <laughs> um, there you go, Kent. Yeah, it, 
<laughs> it could do with a bit of service, but it's pretty good. I've got one oscillator down, actually. Mm. But, 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 Kent, that move you restored for me all those years ago could do with a bit of TLC. There we go. Oh, we're, yeah. putting, we're putting you in touch with loads of people today. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Kent will just not answer the call now. Really? Now Kent knows why I'm calling you. Because I haven't run for chat for ages, and now he knows it's not a chat. He knows there's pain involved, you know? Oh, I'm sure he won't mind. He's a lovely sort. Um, so uh, let's let's kind of get back to the uh, the timeline a little bit. So early 2000s, you're, you're working on uh, you know, stuff with with hands, and then you 2005, you start working with Chris Nolan. Let's skip forward a little bit to 2012, and you're working with the guys from Node. So you you've kind of replaced um, was it Gary? I can't remember the, the guy. Yeah, but you, you you replaced <laughs> one one of the, the early members. Um, how, I mean, was that did that just come about again through the fact that you you knew uh, Ed from back yeah. in the day and that and 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 how do you find that you know kind of being back in the band again? Brilliant, brilliant, absolutely. You know, I I knew Ed as as, as I said from the Argent days, and Ed initially came in and he used to drive us mad and then and then we became mates and then he got a job around the corner in the soho sound house which kicked his career off and that's how mm. he got into the psychedelic furs and then got into production and then you know produced all those fab records and sway yeah. i think he's sorry the game and um hello ed and um <laughs> yeah i'd seen ed chatting online about Peter Bauman's original Project Electronics system. And I think Hans got in the mix and was talking about Ed's system, which is this sort of, uh, you know, kind of pre-patched, lots of, lots of hardwire routing, loads of modification done by Gert Jellas in Germany from the Moon Modular people. Mm-hmm. So Hans wanted to basically build one of his own and he got in with Ed and then we all started talking and Ed got to me and... And um, we went out for a drink, just the one, for a few hours. And at the end of that, we oh, were thinking of doing some more stuff with Node. Would you fancy doing it? So that was it, you know. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Because I was so, so, so jealous of not of, of not being part of the Paddington thing. Mm. I was in so incandescent with jealousy and eat, eaten up by it that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see it now. Like, uh, what I Absolutely brilliant. So we went to the studio after after in in, in true no form. Yeah, you know, we all met up, and I knew Flood. Mm-hmm. I knew Flood, uh, not very well, but I knew him a little because I'd done some stuff at uh, done some horrible records at uh, uh, Trident. But you know, he was engineering them, and I was programming them. There, you know, <laughs> so but the music was maybe not so good. But that wasn't our fault. Okay. <laughs> and um, so we knew each other and we knew that we that we kind of got on. And so that side of it was easy. And then we met up in London and they said, oh, just come, come down, come, come down. And, and we came, I went to Battery with Flood has a studio there. I think he's still, I don't know, I think he's still there. But we went in and I took, I, I took my sequential circuits take five, which, no, it wasn't invented. <laughs> so I took all this, which... Basically, <laughs> replicas in a much larger box <laughs> with a slightly larger keyboard as well. But you know, <laughs> similar budget, similar budget. Come on, and and we and we we laid down what was in in one day. We laid down what was pretty much, I think, uh, two and a half of the tracks for Node Two. Right. And then we then in true Node Four, we struck while the iron was hot and got back ten weeks later and did the other tracks. <laughs> and then. <laughs> and then and then the and then the tour happened, you know, the yeah. one month tour, <laughs> which was, which was you know, honestly, I think that was the best gig I ever played. Like, that was a great was show, fun. yeah. Oh man, I mean, just to, just to have both instruments up there, and mm. you know, I remember saying to Flood after the gig, so it's like, you know, these sort of wild beasts, these these you know like these things that have been chained, you know, and you just you, know, you just let them go. Yeah. That anything's possible, and that gig was so much on a wing and a prayer, like nobody would believe. And I thought Dave might spill the beans on his last um, 
<laughs> so I will. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's 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 a, it's a fantastic show. And so when we had um, Dave on the show, you know, we said you know you can still get this thing on on Blu-ray, and it's you know even if you haven't got any interest in the gear, because I mean people like you know us, you know, we're, we're we're sat there listening, but we're also looking. What's he got there? How's he using that? But um, it's it's something you can just kind of get lost in, just purely from from the music perspective, as well as. You know, lusting after all of the gear. Yeah. Well, it's a fantastic show. It really was. I mean, you know, one of the things that I don't think anybody really, you know, realised because I don't think anybody spilled the beans on this. But we, we actually did re- we did re- rehearse for five days before the show, right? Right. The first day, we had to get Gert over from Berlin <laughs> with a soldering iron and loads of bits. <laughs> and, you know, he's changing the oil in Ed's system and the steam. <laughs> <laughs> so that took that day out completely. The second day was much better, but everything was working. Basically, we never got past. I think we just about managed to play two consecutive tracks, but I think we only did it once. That's in five days of rehearsals. So when we did the show, the reason we put the interval in because we never thought we'd be able to play four consecutive tracks right. without Gert having to come on with a mop and a bucket and <laughs> and to like you know sort Ed's nerves out and all that. Yeah. and the, the weird thing was it worked absolutely seamlessly it just yeah. worked and, we, and when it came to take the interval we looked at each other and said should we, should we do it should we do it you know, yeah we already made our minds up yeah. we, so we went and did it but but the idea was was in the true spirit of, of ambient music design if it all went horribly wrong which we're fully expecting it to do horribly wrong. Everybody would be treated to me just going, you know, for like 20 minutes or as long as it's sort of Dave. (laughs) (laughs) And Flub would be like, you know, lost. But yeah, we we had massive sync problems. We had massive, I mean, it it wasn't a problem with one particular rig. Everything was so um, fragile and so... um, Everything was on was on 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 the edge, so yeah. it wasn't just you know it, it wasn't just Ed rig. Every, everything was held together by string and yeah. You know, yeah. But it was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant, and there was so much um, you know um, almost like telepathy mm. between us all. You know, you'd look over and somebody'd be looking at you, and you'd be looking at and you'd be listening, and you'd, you'd listen to what you're doing. It was like it was like a proper band. Yeah. Which I think no, it is, and and it's my great regret that we never got to um, do several more shows. Whether we will or not, I, yeah. I, I I would love to. I, so I would drop everything tomorrow. Mm. You heard it here first. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the one thing that always struck me about that gig, I, I, I wasn't lucky enough to go to the actual gig. So I, I lived, you know, vicariously through it, through uh, Neil Fellows, who came and did all the photography. He was a friend of mine. He was telling me all about it. And then when they got the Blu ray, I was able to, you know, kind of sit and, and take it all in. And I, I sat watching you guys and these four guys with, you know, mostly with your faces, your backs to the audience because your faces are in the gear. And you're really in the moment, and you you know, you are gelling, and you're doing this amazing stuff. And then I got to thinking, well, you know, we've got craft work that stand on stage now behind four podiums with a laptop, I know. and 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 yet craft work are held in this this high esteem as being, you know, pioneers, and and, and, and this is what it's all about. These guys in front of the actual <laughs> gear that could go bang any moment, and they're yeah. flying by the seat of their pants and making great stuff, and it just really. <laughs> It just kind of brought home this this um, kind of I guess this false god thing with with craft work. Now there's just you know Ableton yeah. Live yeah. And, and four laptops. Yeah. I know. You, you know, you know, I I, uh, I I I felt the same thing many times. Not just about you know craft work, whatever, but um, with musicians that uh, not only the gear that they use, but the techniques that they use. And there's so many. Uh, like I I've seen a lot of guitarists that are just technically off the charts you know super fast and all that kind of stuff but it's so boring even though they got every technique down and perfect and i think somebody had once described uh, eddie van halen's playing as uh, uh rolling down the you know falling down the stairs and landing on your feet 
And yeah. that kind of that kind of tension is needed, just like we talk about the imperfections in you know analog synthesizers versus digital, um, is needed to make it exciting. And so very much having all those you know great vintage pieces of gear, not knowing where everything is going to sync up exactly right or something's going to blow, can make it a really exciting and interesting experience. Yeah, you also wet yourself. <laughs> <laughs> But it's but it's but it's what it's about. I don't think we had hardly we had hardly any machines with any memories. I mean, there was yeah. the whole thing was completely, utterly, totally live. And on the last day of rehearsals, we sat down and we said, you know, there all these people have paid all this money to come and see this show, and it could just be like you know, two hours of hum and silence and very <laughs> embarrassed people. Um, so we said, what if we? We, we recorded all of the rehearsals and what if we just had it on Pro Tools and we just kind of slipped it in when it, and Flub went, no, 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 we're not doing that. And I admit, I actually stood there and thought, what a bad idea, is it? <laughs> not as if my mum was going to come and she'd be really, really upset. But um, actually, my wife and kids came, which is brilliant, and, um, and I actually really enjoyed it. But, but we decided... We do it true to the pioneers of mm. synthesizing music, and we make. And if and if we end up with egg in our face, and that's basically what 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 what, what we did, and it works out. Yeah. You know, but you know, actually, weird thing. I was just thinking. I mean, this is what music used to be like. I mean, I yeah. I was at the yeah. Fairford Halls gig in Croydon, which is at the back of my art school, and I went to art, art college. Um, to see Tangerine Dream, I think it's seventy five. It was a gig that was recorded for Rubicon. Mm -hmm. And Hans was there, although I didn't know him. And Flub was there. I didn't know him, him either. Wow. So there's, you know, three people that will play parts, you know, great parts in my life in different times. And um, here, here, here we all were, just, just you know, watching, watching three, three guys walk across a tightrope with, with modules, you know. Yeah. <laughs> the thought that we might be doing that later. Um, it was brilliant, actually. It was absolutely yeah. brilliant. And I think if we do it again, well, you know, God, no, it's a huge if. Well, I hope you do. But, yeah, I do. I do. I'd love to. The thing with the uh, you know the walking the tightrope is that uh, when you have musicians of that caliber uh, playing and, and something does go wrong, it, it's not as though the whole show is wrecked. Where a lot of times, like you know, beginner musicians are like they don't know what else to do. Whereas you guys have known your instruments so well inside and out and you've been musicians for so long that i kind of i've kind of found in those experiences like the band just works together to make something and it comes out uh it ends up coming out interesting and so it can be kind of a win-win situation like things go well and just as planned you're like this is great things don't go planned yeah. and you end up improvising something completely new yeah. oh very interesting mm -hmm. too yeah. It's 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 that you know golden rule as if you play a mistake live you play it again and people think you meant it. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Served me really well. Such <laughs> yeah. um, is my entire career actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's no that's around 2012. Um, yeah. Since then, um, oh, you've no. been you've been kind of really getting into composing as your your main focus now yeah. for, for a number of years and yeah. uh, you've won a few awards as well which is cool so tell us a little bit about what mel wesson does these days well you know i'm still on speaking to good hands so just about <laughs> he sent me a text the other night actually um of the first synth he ever owned which i found richard long our own music richard uh -huh. lawson our own music had it and it was Hans's very first synth, which was a VCS3. And he thought Hans knew about it. So I rang Hans or sent him a test a few months ago. And anyway, he sent me a photograph of it the day before yesterday. And there it is, the, the synth that, that started all. But um, no, um, when I was doing Hannibal and was creating all these sounds and textures, a couple of guys came over from London. They came over to what was their media ventures, which became the remote control in Santa Monica. And Hans said, oh, you've got to meet this guy, Mel. He makes this crazy sounds. He does this crazy stuff. And they said, you know, we could put this out as a you know, library album. Right. And actually, back in those days, you know, I don't think anybody really took library music that seriously. You know, quality was great for some and not good for others. It was a very strange market, you know. It wasn't something that people wanted to necessarily associate themselves with. But 
Um, which is, you know, that said, there was some fan- there's some fantastic stuff there. You know, I'm not, not knocking the whole genre, but these guys, with Russell Emanuel and Dolph, had um, a comic called Extreme Music, which which I still do lo- loads of stuff for now. And um, their their idea was, you know, we're just going to shake it up. We're going to shake this whole thing up. We're going to do things that other people have never dared do before. And you know, I mean, for example, now if they if they if they do rap music instead of you know getting bored in middle age <laughs> middle age, I wish you know, <laughs> chaps from Sussex like me, they <laughs> they go to Snoop Dogg and they say Snoop, you know, you know, give us some rap music, and it's kind of how how it should be. So they 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 get the right people to mm. to, to make honest music, you know, honest whatever. So anyway. They really liked this this stuff that I did, so I, I did more stuff with them and forgot about it completely. And then I think when we were doing Batman Begins, um, I was sitting there one day and I got a royalty check. I was like, oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> What's this from? <laughs> really? <laughs> That's quite good, isn't it? So I, these guys, but we were in Hampstead, in Air Studios. They were just down the road in Camden, so we had another couple of meetings. I did another album. And it was always feeding it. It was always trying to, it was always something that I would do when I wasn't going to L- LA, which I sort of went back and forwards for about 12 years. And eventually I started to realize that this was not only a good idea in terms of, you know, it was financially viable, but it gave me an inor- inordinate amount of freedom. And I could work in my own studio and I could pretty much do as long as what I did was had 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 some kind of focus and some outlet, you know, like it had to sell, you know, it had to be placed. It couldn't just be random outpourings of a, mm. yeah. <laughs> a lonely old guy sitting in his studio. <laughs> so, um, that's sort of basically, I suppose, for want of a better word, it, it sort of took over my priorities. Um, and I mean, Hans didn't do, he did Interstellar, didn't he? Swan, and I didn't do, <laughs> didn't. and um, so the more I wasn't going out there, the more I was focusing on this, and, and it just seems to be really through through no great, you know, no great plan, it never has been a great plan, that, that, that you know, I've basically been writing for Extreme now, for almost exclusively for the past sort of nine, you know, nine or ten years, right? And, and I slipped the odd you know, the old other project in. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, the extreme thing has been really, really good for me in many ways. But, you know, um, creatively, it's been absolutely brilliant. It's been yeah. absolutely brilliant. So, you know, I mean, it, to be able to sit in a room and you still have the same, you know, you still have the same thought process. You still have to think about uh, what what's the end you know where where is this going to live in in the real world once it lives this once it leaves this, this studio? So you're still dealing with emotions and atmospheres and feelings and things like like that, but you're dealing with it in a much wider, more sort of generalized scale. Mm. Um, so that's what I do, and 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 it, and like the last forty years of my career, which I actually realised the other day, I've had a career of five decades, wow. which. It's incredible, but it's only That's one year of, of the 70s and one year of the 2020s. Uh, right? It all counts. <laughs> it all counts. But it, but it was like, oh, well, hang on, it. But it, there's never been a plan. I've said it many times, so I've never been a plan. And, and, and one thing leads to the other, leads to it. And, you know, you, you just think one day the phone's not going to ring or you're not going to get the email or you're not going to get the, the text and, and touch wood somewhere you know it still sort of carries on and yeah. one idea morphs to something else and one career path for want of a better word you know becomes something else but but you never lose touch you know mm. you still never lose touch with people that you've worked with be, be, before and i'm still you know i i still i'm in contact with hands i i i did his 2016 tour mm-hmm. um and and i did the bond movie which yes. may actually come out Imagine yeah that. Well, I was yeah. going to say, you know, I mean, I know clearly you must be under lock and key in terms of what you can talk about about that. But should is there anything you can give us, like a, 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 a just how wonderful it was to to have worked on a Bond movie? Oh, it's Bond, isn't it? I mean, you know, yeah. we, as, as like a little kid, I think I was about nine or ten, and I saved up all my pocket money, pestered my mum and dad like crazy, and got that little corgi toy. Does anybody yeah. remember? Yeah. 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 
the day we finished, the day it was all over with, I went to Lewis in Sussex, mm -hmm. and I walked into this little ant antiques place, you know, not antiques place, and there was one on the shelf, no. and, I, and I had to have it. Yeah. So I got that. Bond, yeah, I mean, it, wait, you can't say no to Bond, can you? You no. really can't. And and it's incredible, and it's 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 a it's a great story, and of course it's Daniel Craig's last outing. Yeah. Um, and we haven't been able to talk to anybody about it on pain of being, yeah. you know, sawn in half. Or yeah. You've had to we keep. Have... You've had to keep the secret for several years <laughs> as well. <I> mean, yeah. <laughs> <it's>... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we're it's another week now, right? <laughs> yeah. But it has Aston Martins. Yeah. And it's got twangy guitars in it. Johnny Marr plays those. It's very, yeah. very cool. Oh, nice. And it's got bits of brass in it. And it's got little bits of ambient music design. Yeah, you uh, <laughs> should be and, looking out for those. Yeah, little, yes. little, little, little bits here and there. And it was, um, couldn't believe that, you know, we were, we, we finished, I think we finished it in March. Mar oh, you know, I can tell you, March the 7th, 2020. Mm hmm. I went out. I went over to see Hans, and a couple of guys was, were there, and we. And I think they were all going back home the following day, and then I went had dinner with Ed Buller that evening, and that was the last dinner I had with anybody for about a year, eighteen wow, months. Yeah. Yeah. Who, who, who was going to know? Crazy times. So I, bet, I mean, I bet you're, you're really excited for 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 it to eventually, yeah. you know, hit the cinemas. And uh, I can't. I mean, I'm I'm a huge Bond fan. I cannot wait for it. I'm so disappointed that Daniel Craig is uh, going. Um, but you know, it's inevitable. It's it's part and parcel of it. I just hope that they can replace him with someone good. But the 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 music of Bond. I mean, it's intrinsically, you know, there is the theme. Yeah. How uh, how far away from that can you go? Can you go, or did we go? That's the question. <laughs> well, <laughs> however much you can tell us without getting shot. <laughs> I think the answer is the same. Can right. I just say that? <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's fine. I think no. the answer is the um, same. You know, I mean it. Really hard to say, isn't it? You know, mm. I mean, and also when you when you're involved with with Bond, which is something which is you know it, it's it's been with all of us, you know, most yeah. of us all all our lives, isn't it? How much do you want to? You know, I mean, look, he still drives an Aston Martin, right? Yeah, and he still drinks mart martinis. He, he hasn't gone to my ties or yeah, you know, <laughs> and and he's you know they're always they're still shaken, not stirred. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Let's You've got to see. stay true to it, haven't you? You've got to stay true to it. I think you have, but but there's obviously scope, you know. There's obviously scope. Yeah. But um, yeah, it, it was the very last last minute thing. It was a, you know, the I mean, the, the I believe the, the production. Uh, the the release date was changed even before we got on board. Mm. I think it was supposed to be released, you know, the, the day or the week before we got on board, and it was put put off. I think it's this is the third or fourth time. Wow, so yeah. I mean, immensely frustrating for everybody that's in, that, that's involved, and there's such great people. You know, they're such great, such great. You know, Barbara Broccoli and yeah, Michael and all those people. You know, it's such a great um, group of people that you've heard of it that, that, that's actually got oh, hello. You know, it's, it's yeah. fantastic, and, and you know that that they're passionate about it, and it's been their entire lives too. So they don't want it to sit in a on a, in a can or on a hard drive, whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. And every, everybody wants it out. It's such a difficult time. Yeah. So I'm I'm assuming obviously I, I don't want to put you in any awkward position. So please, you know, tell me <laughs> if I do. I'm assuming you you've seen the completed movie. I've seen it all in bits. I've never sat down. I sat down and watched it all when we first started. Right. And since then, I saw it at different times, at different bits. They were very, very protective of who sure, sure. even within the team they were really protective mm, you know yeah, i couldn't yeah. get a picture i was never given a picture no so i, I would have to go up and you know watch a scene discuss a scene yeah you know. could, could I, mean, I ask uh, yeah. re regarding uh, the, mu the movies that you've worked on I've only, I've only worked on two small independent films you know i'm not like Anne zimmer out but 
when I watch those films, I find it very hard to watch the film. I'm like just concentrating on what I did and yeah. how I could have improved it. And I, yeah, I couldn't, I, it, you know, I could have made that bit a bit more dynamic or yeah. whatever. It, it, the the films that you've been involved with are like, <laughs> they're, they're like classics, some of them. Do you ever sit there and watch them and think, ah, I, I'm not too happy with that bit there? Or, 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 Worse. Or, did you forget? Did you forget <laughs> that you were involved in it and and just watch it as a whole? Takes a while. Yeah. But you know, you know what's what what's even uh, the, the first time seeing them when they're done, particularly somebody like uh, Nolan. You know, Nolan had this thing because because we we you know when the stuff is delivered to any to any dub stage, it's massively wide now. You know, you, you don't turn up with like a you know a reel of half inch master you know it's massively <laughs> wide and unbelievably wide you can get you can rewrite a cue on a on a on a, on a dub stage if you if, if you have the time and the inclination you know music mm. editors get in there so nolan had this whole thing about my stuff it was always on a separate you know was a separate world and he would call them elements and oh. he would say oh do you have an element for there and stuff that i lovingly placed and carefully placed to the frame you know would be gone and it'd be somewhere else. And it was always, particularly with his movie, it was, it was, you know, with some it wasn't quite so, it was a bit more nerve wracking, but with him it, it was this thing of, you know, I don't know what, what we're going to hear, how much is going to be kept, how I thought yeah. it was, you know, going to work and how much it, if it has been lost by music and lost by sound. I don't care, it doesn't bother me, you know. It, what the most important thing is when, is, everything works together as a whole you know there's nothing worse when you when you start noticing music mm. yeah, for the, yeah for the for the for the, for the yeah. wrong reasons you know you should be yeah. enjoying the 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 experience you know of, of being in um, um cinema but i suppose to answer your question fully yeah i i find it very hard to watch anything i've ever worked on because mm. I, I i either pick it to pieces or it mm. brings back memories of you know, um, oh, that was when my kids couldn't come over, or oh, oh we went out for dinner that night. Right, we yeah. did that, you know, and, and there's all these like, you know, I, I used to find being in LA like, you know, it, 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 it was, you know, um, it was a double edged sword for me in many, many ways. I love the, I love the, the creativity scene. I've still got, you know, a lot of really good friends there. Being away from home was, I was finding really, really hard. So, you know, so, you know some, some of, some have got really good memories, some of, you know, but yeah, I, I everything comes flooding back, and <laughs> yeah. I, I I saw Black Hawk Down again recently, actually, which is probably one of the things I'm most proud of. I think mean, it was mm. just such an incredible score, and and that one was just you know wow, that that was a a real hardcore film in, mm. in every respect. You know, making yeah. the score to that was 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 not was was not easy. Yeah, I've got a question about your um. Well, about the, the process that, that Hans uses, um, you mentioned about having this, you know, this kind of team of people, Ron Howard, uh, you know, yeah. called it like a, a, a bank job. I, I got the In impression, that, yeah, I mean, I get the impression that that's, you know, that the, the likes of, of, of Hans Zimmer, Trevor Horn, you know, did the same. He had a team of experts in lots of different fields that he kind of put together his crack squad that would ultimately deliver what he wanted but it also seems that Hans is also um, very supportive of the individuals in that team and pushing them to you know to excel in their own different fields because you see names you know like yourself like Lorn Balf that are coming out of that system and now forging their names in their own rights in their respective you know areas of excellence is is that a conscious thing that he does is that Something that's fostered within the team. Had... Yeah, I, I think he, I think he gets a lot of. I think he genuinely gets a lot of uh, satisfaction mm. from you know giving people op op opportunities and, and seeing what they can do with it. He's not one for creating, um, you know, given, you know, finished scenarios. He's not one for okay, I'm going to take you from this and I'm going to put you in there and you are going to do this. Mm. He'll sort of. You know, put bread down the path and you kind of follow it, <laughs> see where it leads, kind of. Mm. Really. And you know, for, for some people, it 
for some people it really doesn't work that environment really doesn't work some people their careers go off with a complete tangent you know they people go in with no idea what they want to do they just love film music and they might end up being a, a composer they might end up being a music edit, editor a picture editor who knows you know yeah the certainly um hans's world definitely has opened up you know an enormous amount of um, contacts and there's been some incredibly successful composers as it's only lawn you know it's oh, yeah. stuff now it's really well i mean um, that was because the, the reason really, i asked that was because um you know lawn did this film um during lockdown uh called songbird and right. he reached out to myself and a bunch of other people mm. and said i'd like you to contribute to this stuff and, he, and we were sent yeah. cues and we had to do stuff to it yeah. And it just felt like, wow, this is kind of like Lawn's now paying it forward, just like Hans paid yeah, it forward. Yeah. And it kind of feels, it has a really kind of positive vibe to it. And it just felt yeah. a really comfortable thing. I mean, it was yeah. stressful as hell, but, you know, it oh, was fun. Cool. It was great <laughs> fun. And it just kind of felt that th this was kind of a thing that, you know, I, I, I don't know what, what Hans' ba background was, whether he was involved and he was given opportunities. Now he's passing it forward, and now the people he passed it forward to are, are doing the same. But it, what it, you know, I, that's a great way to do things, yeah. isn't it? I mean, I, I suppose Hans' opportunity, you know, I, was uh, given to him by Stanley Myers. Right, yeah. Who, you know, uh, who he's, I mean, he's probably best known for the theme to The Deer Hunter. Mm. Um, and he was a lovely man. I, I, my very first Fairlight sessions were with him back in 80, 80, 85. And yeah. I can't remember when he, when he, when he, when he, when he left us. Very sad, mid nineties, yeah. something like, like that. Phenomenal composer. And Stanley just didn't want to do the electronic thing, and he could see that this was, you know, something that was coming in and coming in. And and you know, um, so he gave hands. He he gave hands his, you know. Starting, starting life, I suppose. Yeah, and was something that he obviously always wanted to do, and, and has a tremendous aptitude for it. But, um, but you kind of have to start somewhere, and someone has to. You know, open. It helps if someone can open the door. You know, yeah, Stan, very well respected. Still is really well. Um, yeah. yeah, really well respected. A really, really great guy. I remember working on a couple of things with him with Nick, um, with Nick Rogue. You know, who did. Um, oh yeah. Performance, and, mm -hmm. and, 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 yeah. and, and really bizarre being in a room with these guys, and you're like, yeah. "What am I doing?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. imposter syndrome, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Somebody um, knows this. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> um, ben, Chris, have you got any other questions you want to um, to fire at, uh, at Mel? Well, well I, I've got a big list of stuff here, and you wouldn't believe it if I read them out because they've all been answered. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Many different roles performed: ambient music designer, electronic uh, electronic arrangements, score sound designer. Uh, and I put roles, some self explain It's exactly what you said before. <laughs> some self-explanatory, <laughs> but some maybe not. Can you provide a brief overview about, about what these roles are like on a day-to-day -day basis? I, I'm, I'm out of ideas now. I've got all of them are on here. But uh, I did have... Um, I wondered what... I did wonder what was your favourite film that you'd worked on, but you kind of hinted at Black Hawk Down before. Actually... Yeah, Black Hawk Down. I thought musically, probably Hannibal was tremendous. Right. Yeah, phenomenal. And the and the Batman movies, you know, Dark Knight was absolutely fantastic to work on because we because we had that great. I mean, actually, the the best experience was was undoubtedly Batman Begins because it was done in London, mm. and we kind of took over Air Air Studios for sort of three or four months. We had like all the rooms in their houses in one James's. You know, Ian Howe was in another, and you know, the Hans brought his text over, and Ramin was a right at the top, Ramin Jawadi, and he's ended up doing mm. Game of Thrones and all that mm. stuff. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Lorne, Lorne, Lorne was there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so it, that was that was great. You know, we, we'd, we'd get in early, we'd leave late, we'd have dinner together and sit there in the evenings and chat and kick ideas around it's seven days a week you know mm, it's a yeah, really yeah. really creative process mm. you've been, you've been in, involved in some like mega uh, impressive uh, movies <laughs> but what 
what is on the wish list? What would you absolutely not be able to refuse to work on? If so, well, I couldn't did. turn Bond down, and I did try. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nobody, nobody could turn Bond down. I don't think. No, I mean, you know, um, 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 oh, I just, I honestly don't know. I, I, it's a really good question, a really difficult one, really yeah. difficult one. I don't feel the same way about. You know something as mega like Star Wars as I as I do about Bond. I don't really have the connection with that. Yeah, or Star Trek or any any of those. I think those franchises have become, you know, so expanded. The whole universe literally is expanded within all of all of those. Yeah. I, I you know what I quite like to do. And if they made a Train Spotting three, I'd love to get involved in that. Mm, yeah, I yeah. love Train Spotting one, and I thought yeah. two was going to be the most unbelievable disaster. And I think, you know, I'm going to stick my neck out here, but I think it's one of the most worthy sequels ever yes. made. I think yeah. it's absolutely fantastic. And, you know, I'd love to be involved in something like 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 that. I don't think this, you know, it doesn't have to be a big budget movie, you know, for it to have value and, um, you know. Yeah. Work. It, ties, it ties in with what somebody's asking in the chat room now as well. Like the, the same question on synthesizers, what would be the ultimate yeah. synthesizer that you couldn't refuse if, I if you see got that yeah. oh this is really difficult okay favorite favorite polysynth is my ppg wave 2 yeah there's not very many of them and it, it just doesn't nothing sounds like it it is just mm. so 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 powerful i remember in you know, the first note i played was this big Bass note. I don't even think it. Well, I didn't even know what it was. I just plugged in and I hit a preset and you know, well, okay. I you know, I, a sound and, and this big bass sound. I didn't know what number six was. I could never remember. You know, <laughs> and everybody stood around. What the? What? <laughs> and I suppose from a mono synth, it's got to be the EMS, the synth. Yeah, yeah. But if I was stuck on a desert island. And had one synth, it would have to be something I'd actually, you know, actually make some music out of, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It'd be the Wardle, the Wardle Quantum, which I, it, which yeah. I love, and you know, I like the sound of it. Sorry, Dave, and um, it just, it's just everything I think a synth should be. It's, it's forward thinking, you know. It's, it's not just a replication of the old song, although it does that really well. And it's yeah. got that PPG history and it does its analog stuff. But it has yeah, all this, yeah. you know, it's got the resonators and the, all kinds of stuff. It's, it's, it's a great, great, it's a great box. And, and I'm sure it will develop further. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's pretty, I'm a big, I'm a big Wolfgang Palm fan, actually. I'm a, a huge, mm. huge Wolfgang Palm. For me, he's as important as um, Bob Moe. Yeah. He really yeah. is. You know, he's a absolute genius and he actually signed one of the panels on my pbg 300 series mm, love that's it. Great. Yeah, that's i took it apart and sent it to him <laughs> 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 yeah. good luck putting it together <laughs> so any other questions one more, one more question for me um something that's been interesting you know as as you've talked about your career and kind of just watching all these things that you've not been afraid to jump into situations that uh, were new or different um, to work uh, on these, you know, soundtracks where you said, I didn't, you know, I'm not sure what I'm going to do, but I'm just going to get in there and do it. Along with that has come a lot of great collaborations with other, other wonderful composers and musicians. What would your tips be for for somebody that is going to get into a collaboration of of any sort, whether it be in a band or uh, a comp, you know composing or film? What are the tips? Or what are the things that made it successful for you? Hmm, that's a difficult one. I would say just follow what you believe in. You know, just do it because you think it's got some value. It means something to you. Hmm. Yeah. And I think these days, you know, t- technology is so advanced. It's really easy to sound pretty good, you know. It's really easy to, to get the sample like to get the this, to, yeah, yeah. to get the action strings. I mean, I, I was there when Hanks was writing the Austin Arto for, for Batman, and you go into James Newton Howard's room, and he's written an entire queue, you know. 
in one day. You go in Hans's room, he's going, duh, 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 duh. and you know, and it took days to work out those notes and, and figure it out, you know, and it became like a like a language, and he's stuck with it. He stuck with it for days and days and days and made made that happen. Of course, now you can buy action strings and hold down one note and then and then you know, but that doesn't make you it doesn't make you hands, you know. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, you know, just to try and have an individual voice is the most important thing to me. And I think that's my <clears throat> um I'm actually really surprised by the conversations we've had tonight, because I don't often think I really don't often think about the stuff that I've done and and um I know, you know, you know, Robbie said, Oh, you know, from humble beginning, I'm kinda of humble now. I'm really surprised thinking about it. <laughs> such nice things about it. But I think the only reason that I've managed to, 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 to keep some kind of career going is because I you know, I I have enormous amounts of self doubt, I think as we all do, but but and I think my self doubt is more aimed at God, you know, what are people going to think of this? Is it going to work? You know, are, 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 are people going to suddenly dis- discover that this is all, this guy's just been a charlatan for the last 40 years? Or, or <laughs> but, I, but, I, but at the same time, you know, keeping that going, keeping that, that those thought processes going, every, every time you start something new, you sort of wonder whether this is the one that you're going to really screw up on, you know? Mm. And I think that, that sort of makes you want to go forward with it all. Um, keep you on your toes, isn't mm-hmm. it? Yeah, and I, I don't think I've ever had, as keep saying tonight, I've, don't, I've never had a plan, and I don't really listen to other people, you know, in, musically. I, I suppose I, I suppose I do, but, I, I, you know, I, in, in terms of film composers, I don't really listen to film music, to be honest. Um, so that's why I found it a lot easier to sort of carve my own little niche in this world rather than try and be someone else you know i could never be hans i could never be james newton howard or my friend jim dooley who's a great composer or lawn or any of those people i could never do do what they did you know and I, I realized very quickly on when i went to remote you know there were so many people that were really adept and really skilled and very knowledgeable that were that can do that kind of thing so in order to survive i had to do something that i was good at you know mm-hmm. and and for me, it was kind of making sound work, you know, making w- one sound work that, you know, do do the do the do the job of a two minute cue almost, you know. So it was finding ways that I could make mm. that work. I hope this doesn't sound too pretentious. No, it doesn't. <laughs> no, it's, it's fascinating. It makes really a, is. It makes loads of sense as well, yeah. doesn't it? Like working it, especially like with, like working with hands as well in that like kind of it. Uh, environment you find your place within the team which is that then becomes your place within the industry doesn't it, it it's like a, a well, microcosm yeah, of the industry within there you're all competing for roles and stuff which is like you know. I, th- I mean you, you know rob mentioned earlier you know working with youth and i said that was a real real eye-opener for me a real eye-opener because he's had such an anarchic approach to it all and he and I think he sort of made he really took me out of a box and kind of shook shook me up, you know. Mm, and, yeah. Um, that was really important. Yeah, I think it's, it's I think it's important to to step outside your comfort zone, but also, like you say, you know, I I suffer from imposter syndrome. I think there's lots of people in the chat room right now saying, "Yeah, yeah I'm reading that." <laughs> yeah, all, all saying, "Yeah, yeah, me too, I've me been too." <laughs> yeah, but I, th- I think I think it's what what drives us to keep trying to prove yeah. our worth yeah. you know we, we, we're try, always constantly trying to look I, I, I'm trying to justify my existence here and in that itself then drives you on to produce stuff that maybe nobody else can do and, and there is your value to to to, to, yeah. to the project well you know what you said about uh, Mel what you said about sound and, and finding your sound and, and uh, going in on that, uh, Howard Scar in the chart had uh, in the chat had said, you know, I, yeah, I know that imposter syndrome well, but that he's one of the people that I would think, you know, I didn't know who he was when I first got my my I think I, I bought Zebra Yuhi Zebra, and he had done a lot of patchwork for that, and uh, I'm like, 
of all the people going through and listening to the sounds like this guy really knows what he's doing he's got a great sound he's got a great ear because anybody can learn technical stuff but there's somebody that does it artistically does it really well and certainly mel that has been you and your career as well and that's something that i really admire oh, oh, i'm with you 100 percent on um, uh, howard yeah i love his i love his work i really do yeah you know, I, absolutely he's somebody, somebody earlier was it? Somebody earlier was saying, you know, that you get the D50 out and you get your digital native dance. Oh, this is incredible. You can't use it in a track. Mm. Well, that's where Howie's really good. You know, his stuff can can be used. Yes, yes. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, he's, 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 he's really got a great ear. Uh, and Zebra, very lucky to have. Yeah. But I like Zebra, you know. I like Zebra. Yeah. But I wish Howie would. <laughs> Howie, would you like to program my wardrobe? Would you like to give me like four pounds? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Fixing it, somebody love... else up with another job. There. Yeah, go on. <laughs> um, Mel, it's been absolutely brilliant um, talking to well, you this this evening. Um, fascinating stuff, and we could go on for hours and hours. But um, we've been here for nearly two and a half, um, so. I'm very conscious of the time but um i just wanted to say you know thank you again for coming on the show and for mm. telling us you know these wonderful tales and uh your experiences and your knowledge is is just fantastic um i just saw another question very quickly um i sing the body electric in the chat room it says what years did mel work at argus if it was 79 maybe he sold me my yeah. first synth well, so, yeah. my 1979 ladies and gentlemen was the year that i got married Oh, there you go. Yeah, and you, and and a, a, a some slightly little known fact was I got engaged at a hand Zimmer. <laughs> <laughs> this guy, um, he's just he's forever in your life, isn't he? I know. He? He, I, I can't. I, I've tried. You know, he's just. <laughs> um, yeah, 1979. I would have most definitely been there. I think yeah. I left. Um, I left. Um, 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 I sort of dabbled in and out of it for a bit. The end of 79. Probably left the beginning of 1980. Mm. What did you buy? Yeah, did what, you, what was uh, icing the body electric in the chat room? What was you said you, your first synth? What was it? Tell us. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> he's because the chat's about twenty seconds behind the the broadcast. So oh, we'll, right. we'll 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 pad for a few seconds and yeah, eventually, well, hopefully, he'll um, put it in there. Howard says uh, I got married on Han, Han Z- uh, Dime too. <laughs> Right <laughs> <laughs> yes well we need to get hands on the show um and i know that kent has been you know poking and prodding so uh, any yeah. any more poking and prodding hopefully maybe he's watching or he's he's dangerous with his presence we, at we some know point. like everybody around him now at this point yeah. like mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> i'm, actually, I'm actually, I, don't think he is, I, I don't think he is watching this very rudely on his facebook page he put up that tonight was Tina Guel's album launch at the same time that we started. Now, where would you say <sighs> be? We need to have words. We need okay, to Tina. Yeah. 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 So we have an answer. Um, the the synth that was bought was an EDP Wasp. Very likely. Yeah. yeah. Very very yeah. likely. I had really long hair. <laughs> really long. I was a real hippie. As all the good ones were. Yeah. Um, awesome. yeah. Yeah. So listen, um, it's been absolutely fascinating. It's great to to, to talk with you and to, to hear you know, your stuff, um, Mel. If if you are, I'm um, hoping most of the people that are watching this are part of the Facebook group that we run. Mel's uh, part of that as well, um, and he contributes, mm-hmm. which is fantastic. So you know, if you want to ping him with questions in there, that'd be fantastic. I'm sure he won't mind answering <laughs> a few there. Um, and we'll have to get you back on. Maybe we'll we'll do a kind of reunion. We'll get you. We'll get hands. We'll get lawn. We'll get Ed. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. Um, my my ambition now that we've had you and Dave on, um, we need to get Ed Buller on. Yeah. And I've been uh, the, uh, Dave laid down the gauntlet and said, "Good luck with trying to get Flood on." The That's Sonic my Doom challenge. Doom. Yeah, good luck. So, yeah, we'll try. <laughs> we will try. I mean, crikey, half the people we've had on the show, um, we we didn't think we'd get on. In fact, that segues very nicely into uh, just you know to remind people. Uh, yeah, of who we've got coming up um, in in the in the the weeks to come. So we've we actually we've had a little bit of a, a schedule change. So it's probably worth um, telling people about this oh, one, yeah. just in case you do um, you know book your Friday evenings around our guest list. So um, 
after this evening, I mean, how can we top this? Um, we can't really, but what we do have is another movie composer. Um, we've got David Arnold coming on the show. Oh, right. Um, he, which is going to be fantastic. Bond as well, he's he? done a bit of Bond, so there's a yeah. theme going on here. So it's that's comedy. brilliant. So it must be easy to get into this Bond thing. Too yeah. <laughs> <about> it, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you need so, rock, twangy yeah. guitars, and an Aston Martin. There you go. I've got twangy <laughs> guitars, but not the Aston Martin. So yeah, and I've got neither. Um, anyway, so um, yeah, we've got David Arnold next week. Um, the week after, we were going to have Mick uh, McNeil from X of Simple Minds. Um, we've had to move that. Um, so thanks, Mick, for, for for jiggling that one around. We haven't filled that week's slot yet, but we're going to. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, then we've got Kent Spawn back on for his monthly visit. Um, so do you know? Think of some questions for Kent uh, in his uh, synth repair corner. September twenty fourth. Um, I'm very much looking forward to this one. We've got Martin Ware, uh, oh, Human cool. League, Heaven 17, um, lots of production work for the likes of Tina Turner and so on and so forth. So, yep, yeah, looking forward to catching up with Martin, finding out what he's uh, doing. He's back on the road with Heaven 17 uh, as we speak. Um, and then October 1st, we've got our old friend Ken Flux Pierce, who will Ooh. be um, telling us uh about his experiences now working for asm uh, the manufacturers of the hydrosynth so uh be interesting to hear his viewpoint from inside the camp um following that is the one that i'm getting really quite excited about we've got the legend that is steve Bocaro. um mm. october the 8th um so yeah cannot wait for that one loads of uh, questions for him um, Kent's back again in October as normal, and we've also got Axel Hartman, um, you know, synth designer extraordinaire, coming in. Um, Mick McNeil will then be on the following week after that, the the twenty ninth. So Mick McNeil from Simple Minds. Um, should, can we announce the the new one that we've booked in? I reckon so. Yeah. 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 Um, we're we're ready to go with this because he's drop dead <laughs> gorgeous. Uh, we've got uh, Republic of Keys player. Tim Dorney joining us. Um, so he'll, he'll be on November 5th. Uh, fireworks guaranteed all <laughs> around. So loads of great guests, as we have uh, had another great guest uh, this very evening. Thank you, uh, Mel Wesson. Uh, it's been an absolute joy uh, and Thank pleasure. You all. All of you. Thank you. And uh, do, do come back again soon. Yeah. And we look forward to Bond. Uh, we really yeah. are. Yeah. Um, yeah. Excellent. Uh, what's in your horizon, Ben? Anything fancy for this bank holiday weekend? I, I, can't, I can't think at the minute. I'm still blown away by uh, <laughs> Mel's appearance on the show. He's been fascinating from start to finish. So. This will this will calm you down. Look, there you oh, go. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have you got any gigs lined up this weekend? Uh, just that festival on Sunday. Oh yeah, yeah. And then we've got like three weeks off. So all right. Yeah, it'll give me a chance to refine things. Yeah. Because things always mm. need refining. You know, get yeah. things right yeah uh, yeah cool that's it Excellent really for stuff. me not, not, not that interesting <laughs> anything fun for you you haven't got a long weekend this weekend Chris no but no, uh, no, no. not that I know of no. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah later today I, uh, so I told you guys about my buddy that's got just got the sequential Tom so I'm going to be modding that for mm -hmm. him and uh, I'll do a video about that and then um, uh, just to use a project that I've been working on uh, so uh, Ziad, who we were talking with earlier oh, yeah. of Pulsar Modular, has mm. been working on a couple new plugins, and uh, one of those is getting really close to be released. So uh, I've been help helping him. He's he's the the mastermind of all this, but I've been uh, having a good time doing some beta testing, and also I just did a whole bunch of presets for it as well, and it is really great. And I, I'm just gonna say part of the name is it's Climax, and it's a preamp. And I'm not gonna say too much about it right now, but it's it's a plugin that is just getting tons of use for me. Great, it sounds great on guitars, bass, synthesizers, electric piano, everything I've uh, used it on has been fantastic so far. So we'll, there'll be more coming about this in the coming weeks and uh, I'll be doing some demo demos of it and everything, so. Fantastic, there you go, yeah. P42 Climax lineup. Uh, we are three days, 20 hours, and 30 minutes away from launch. <gasps> Excited. I like countdowns. There you go. Looking forward to hearing that. Um, brilliant stuff. I got a shipping notice today. Oh. I'm, uh, I guess, any guess what I'm getting? Uh, it's 
coming well, just coming uh, who, from Singapore. Who can say? Because we we could have said uh, you know a month ago or two months ago we could have said Yamaha, Yamaha, Yamaha. But now like you're you're you know you're getting all these analogs now. Well, I'm sorry, I've gone back to uh, to <laughs> FM. <laughs> um, what are you getting? I'm getting one of these. Oh, wow. ah, it's shipped. It's the, the Sonicware Live and XFM, um, which uh, has suffered from uh, significant delays in manufacturing, mainly because of the pandemic and the chip shortage. But it finally shipped and uh, is, I think the last time I looked, it was in Singapore. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this little Japanese marvel and having a, a play with that. It's um, not, very not, interesting. It's not 44 keys, is it? No, no, it's it's even smaller than that, and they're not even yeah. proper keys. Look at the, the the black notes. Look at the black notes are all buttons. They wow. little round buttons. Yeah, so there you go. Look at that. But yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, is that is are those kind of keys what you make dubstep on? Something like that. Yeah. Wow. Indeed. So yeah, that's what I'm. I'm hopefully, it's going to be here on Tuesday. So so DHL uh, keep uh, pinging me about. So yeah, looking forward to that. Um, and playing more with the uh, emulation. Oh, the little doggy's back. How is the doggy? Yeah. She's doing well. Yeah, good, good stuff. Good stuff. Good news. Excellent. Well, thank you to everyone that's in the chat. I mean, there's God, the amount of um, uh, messages I've just missed there, just talking about what's coming up. Um, I, I'm so thank you to everyone that's joined us, and thank you to you if you're watching us on Catch Up. Um, do please make sure that you hit the uh, the subscribe button and uh, make sure you do that and then hit the bell to get the notifications and the more subscribers we get then it's kind of better for us because we can do more with the channel so please 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 if you haven't already hit that subscribe button mm -hmm. and it will be incredibly grateful we will be back same time same place next week with david arnold um thank you ben thank you chris and thank you once again mel uh, oh, been an absolute you. pleasure and joy and uh, we will see you say same time same place next week have a fantastic weekend if you're in the uk enjoy that extra day it's the last one now before christmas um have fun has stay safe and of course stay healthy and we'll see you all next week ta-ta oh thank you yeah.